Hello, and welcome to the first Financial Crime Forum focusing on South Africa. I'm Nigel Morris Cotterill. We've been the Financial Crime Forum since the late 1990s, and since moving online, we've presented single issue fora for a global audience. For 2024, we reverted to the format we developed for face to face. We cover multiple issues concentrating on a single jurisdiction, also for a global audience. Our speakers are senior figures in the financial crime discipline, practitioners, and academics. Wherever the forum is focused, we start at 2 p.m. We have three presentations, usually, plus a discussion between the speakers where we put questions you, the audience, have posted to the chat function on the bottom right of your screen. That's if you're using a computer. And then there's a discussion between the speakers and me. We aim to have you at home in time for tea, or if you're watching from your office, in time for signing the mail, which, of course, hardly anyone does anymore. Please do not turn on your microphones. And if your connection is a bit flaky, turn off your own camera. It uses a lot of bandwidth. By the way, for reasons we don't know, Google is not allowing us to share screens, so there are no slides. We are recording, but you will be invisible so long as your microphone is turned off. We have a record of page delegates and anyone who's arrived and is logged into their Google account. We don't have a record of anyone else. So that's the housekeeping. On to today's forum. South Africa is a country of extremes. There are pockets of extreme wealth and pockets of extreme poverty. There are pockets of industry and commerce and huge areas of nothing much. There are areas of rural idyll and areas of overcrowded slums with no proper services. It's a country where I have found that the divisions that we so often hear about are on a case-by-case -case basis. They're not as systemic as we're led to believe. South Africa's present is bound to its history, but not in the ways that many like to claim. Crime is more often akin to crime in Europe than to crime in other parts of Africa. And that often is financial crime, such as embezzlement, theft from employers, smuggling, tax and duty evasion and the like. And a lot of money laundering and the worrying amount of corruption, of course. So these are subjects we have in mind for future fora. Today, we set the scene. Warwick Peters James is a distinguished specialist offender profiler and a forensic criminology. She has more than 15 years of rich intelligence experience. Her expertise spans violence, sex, financial and cybercrime offenders, supported by a specialist degree in offender profiling. She has an honours degree in criminology. She is the founder and, CV, uh, the founder and CEO of Cyberetti and its global affiliates. They pioneer innovative global security solutions and in investigative tools, including a couple of tools which are particularly targeted the hidden stuff on the dark web. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Laurie Peters-James. Hi, Nigel, thank you. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. Um, I'm really excited to share some of my work and, and some thoughts with you today. And um, I'm looking forward to your feedback and a, and a healthy discussion as we finish up with the presentation. So I'd just like to explain a little bit about Cyberity and who we are. So I started Cyberetti while living in Botswana for eight years. And uh, since then, it's expanded to North America, to France. And um, I've recently opened an office in South Africa as well. Um, and then we have some affiliate companies that do specialist development for us um, that have offices in the Ivory Coast and in Nantes in France as well. So what we do as our area of, uh, of speciality is we look at, we've got a number of criminogenic and cyber risk services. Um, we look at global security services. Um, we've got some partners in forensic assessment and in behavior management. And then also we, we specialize in open source intelligence and case management. Um, if you live in South Africa, you know that case management is critical and um, we have severe issues in the management of cases especially given the challenges with south african police services so things do get lost and the case management side we found to be increasingly important um, the second part of our company is the development of specialist products and that would be also uh, identification and authentication technologies, um, secure documents, counterfeiting fraud, and then obviously um, we do brand protection as well um, and um, collaborative supply chain visibility. One of the biggest problems that we face, of course, in modern society is that goods and people disappear 
or change their identities. Um, so we have track and trace solutions that can basically track things like medication, um, ammunition, explosives, um, and just normal agricultural goods from birth to 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 death, basically, or to to final use. And then we have a third division which focuses on engineering. So we're looking at things like water security. We have various water security products, which is, of course, an increasing risk for the world. And from a profiling perspective, um, it falls at the bottom of, of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if people don't have water, they don't care about anything else. If they don't have energy, they don't care about anything else. So they really, crime becomes quite low on the list of priorities. And if we can sort out the problems at grassroots, which are becoming increasingly important in South Africa, then hopefully we can raise awareness and sort out the problems um, further down. So my talk today is on profiling and actually on profiling crime today uh, with a focus on that, that fu fundamentally crime has re remained the same. Um, and that was the brief I was given by, by Nigel, but I really put to you, has it, has crime actually fundamentally re, uh, remained the same or have we reached a point where it is now fundamentally different? And in fact, we don't have to leave our armchairs or our homes uh, anymore to commit the most prolific financial crimes um, and the most effective ones and at very low risk. Um, because unfortunately, as we all know, the South African police services um, from a cyber perspective are really stretched and lack resources. Um, and the private sector has to step in a lot of the time. So the first thing to think about is, is what is profiling? What is profiling actually? And, and, and let's break it down to grassroots. Profiling is just about understanding a set of circumstances and a person. So it's the practice of identifying and observing patterns and then being able to take that and turn it into intelligence and make an inference about individuals or groups. And of course, we use this in everyday life. We decide who are going to be our friends, who are not going to be our friends. And then um, we, we will profile a person and we pick the people that most appeal to us. And in a crime perspective, we do the same. Um, so we have to take the the um, observable characteristics and, and the patterns that are in front of us. And from that, a profiler's job is to, um, to draw inferences and then assist law enforcement to narrow the pool of suspects. Looking at profiling and where I specialize, so I work in the offender or the criminal profiling side of things. And then again what is criminal profiling so this is the process where you analyze the details of a crime scene and the nature of the crime and from that the victim and so on and then you can take that and make an educated guess as to the characteristics of that offender so in in, in other words is your grassroots uh or um, a, a robber for your for a home home invader going to have a similar characteristic from a hacker so we would look at the crime scene the details of their crime from there we can draw inferences on age on on um, abilities on level of education and so on so we use um, inductive research, uh, reasoning a lot of the time for profiling and we make generalizations from specific cases and usually we profile to exclude an offender not include so um so we use inductive reasoning in that way and then also we use deductive reasoning which is applying all your known principles to specific cases and we look at things like the modus operandi which means the method of operation the victimology the signature um, and for example a modus operandi evolves a signature never stays the same, but usually these types of prof this type of profiling is applied to serial crime, like serial rape, serial murder, and and and, and so on, because we need a series of crime to be able to uh, to to draw these patterns. Um, that's on the techniques that we use. Um, we also 
Cyberity developed software called ViceCat that assists in the identification of these offenders. It's it's AI based software, but it's also um, it, it, it assists in crime linkage because the amount of data we have to deal with in crime today is so monumental that it is very difficult to process the data. Um, and then what are the applications? As I said, serial investigation, murders, arson is a very interesting one to profile because there's a very specific profile for arsonists. There's also very specific profiles for internal threat versus external threat that we'll have a look at just now. And um, as I said, again, the main application is to narrow down the suspect pool and predict future actions of the offender. So then another type of profiling that's not very well thought of anymore, but uh, it's definitely still in my opinion, and my opinion always is only my opinion, please not the opinion of, of the general uh, profiling sect, and that is racial profiling. And that's where we have to target a specific race for suspicion in a crime. And it's based purely on race, ethnicity and nationality. Now, <laughs> It's not particularly fair, and it is a, a, an issue that is 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 wildly um, wildly criticised. But I do believe that in certain crimes it has a place. Um, of course, it's discriminatory. It often violates civil rights, and it can lead to mistrust between communities and law enforcement. And it's also often deemed ineffective and counterproductive, especially in today's world as globalisation happens and um, we see sort of a mishmash of culture and um, for example you know where we would only profile for example in a, in a in a terror attack we would immediately start looking at muslim extremists now muslim extremists are re recruiting college campus children so of course the the uses because of the internet now they've got much more access and the uses are less so what are the legal and social implications here? Um, of course, you, you now have various laws and regulations that aim to prevent racial profiling, which is why it's losing precedence as well. But it is persistent in some law enforcement practices and continues and will continue to be a, cont uh, a contentious issue. Another type of profiling is behavioral profiling. Um, how do we define that? So, um, and where is it used? So often this behavioral profiling, we just use in marketing and consumer behavior analysis. In behavioral profiling, we gather data about various individuals and what they do and their preferences and patterns to predict their future behavior. And obviously we can tailor then marketing strategies towards targeting those people. And of course, behavioral profiling is also used in, the behavior, in profiling criminal behavior. Where do we find data sources for behavioral profiling? Well, the primary source today, of course, is online. Just go and have a look at somebody's browsing history, their social media activity, what they post, their purchase history, and uh, sort of how do they respond to advertising. And you'll get a pretty good idea of who those people are. Um, what sort of techniques um, are being employed today and why are they changing? Changing, sorry. Um, of course, there's now we have things like machine learning and data mining, and these uh, techniques are employed to analyze large data sets and, of course, generate consumer profiles. And this is on the increase and will continue to, to increase. What are the applications? Well, um, have you ever been on Facebook? Do you understand that sometimes when you just Google something, suddenly you get a barrage of advertisements about the thing that you Googled? Well, that's why um, it's to pers Google is harvesting our data all the time, which is why I'm very skeptical of using Google and avoid it at all costs. Usually um, Facebook the same, but all of these social media companies are harvesting our data at a rate of knots. They all understand us often better than we understand ourselves and um, that we are seeing targeted advertisements. And for this reason, we need to be very, very careful of what we agree to in the terms of conditions and conditions of the applications that we use. It's really important to read them, although nobody does, but it is important to understand what privacy you're actually relinquishing these companies and what you're allowing them to do with your data. 
Then we've got uh, network profiling. Um, in network profiling, it's uh, used in uh, information technology and cybersecurity usually, and involves monitoring network traffic to identify normal behavior versus anomalies that could identify security threats. Um, what sort of techniques are used here? Well, of course, traffic analysis patterns, um, pattern recognition and any anomaly de detection type tool. Um, also intrusion detection tools are used and security information and things like are used uh, for event management like SIEM systems. So that's quite common. And what does this do? Well, it helps us to identify potential fiber attacks, unusual network activity and breaches. And that helps us to enhance the overall security and posture of the organizations that we work for. The next type of profiling is psychological profiling. Um, what does this involve? Well, it's looking at psychological traits and using those traits to predict behavior. This we often use in the justice system, uh, hence forensic psychologists, and also in corporate settings. Um, how do we do this? It's normally Kind of also a bunch of techniques, things like using psychological traits, doing some interviews and the analysis of personal history and behavior. And increasingly also we can use OSINT to have a look at things like that. Oh, sorry, OSINT is open source intelligence technologies which allow us um, access into people's, uh, to access anything that anybody's put online at any point. And it's a very useful to, tool for psychological profiling as well. What are its applications? Well, it's critical, of course, in the hiring process. Um, we also use it in therapy, um, criminal investigations, and of obviously understanding workplace risk and dynamics. It's really important for that too. And also, strangely enough, for building teams that can work together because you don't want to put two dominant personalities in one team because they're going to fight for dominance and under, undermine team productivity. And then we've got things like geographic profiling. Well, what is that? It's basically using the location of the crime to determine the most probable area where this perpetrator operates and is comfortable operating. Um, it can be done in real life and it can be done on the internet, strangely enough, today. So we, we see where people are comfortable and where they're operating. Are they comfortable, for example, um, in Pretoria, in real life, uh, hunting in, in, in Centurion, for example, pure geographics, or are they comfortable on certain social media platforms? I know it sounds really weird, but are they comfortable in, in Facebook? Are they comfortable? inside of Instagram, you'll see that it's almost like geographically working out where they com their comfortable spaces are on the internet. But also from those social media apps, we can also often tell where they physically are by looking at photographs and so on. What are the applications for this? Well, law enforcement allocate resources effectively and narrow down areas for suspect searches. Um, and then of course, the reason we're all here, financial profiling. So what is financial profiling? Again, we have to analyze financial data to suspect, uh, detect suspicious activity like fraud, and money laundering and insider trading um, and all these types of crimes like scams and things that are going on today. And how do we do that? So these usually include some sort of transaction monitoring and pattern recognition and also obviously financial uh, forensics. Um, these are applications are used by the banks, by the financial institutions and by the regulatory bodies. And this ensures compliance um, to detect financial crimes. Social media profiling, again, we've spoke about. Um, you can find out a lot more about a person by profiling their social media than reading their CV if they do have a digital footprint, that is. And if they don't have a digital footprint, that's a warning sign all in its, on its own. Um, very interesting, the, uh, and there was a coup attempt apparently in the Congo, and all the Americans invested, uh, arrested had almost no digital footprint. So that tells you something all on, on its own. What were a whole bunch of Americans doing in the Congo affecting a coup or possible coup with no digital footprint. So as I said, normal people 
generally have a digital footprint of, of some sort. Um, again, the social media is used for targeted ads, brand management. Also, everybody should be profiling when they're involved in HR for recruitment. So that's really important to do. And um, as you can see, each type of profiling has a distinct pur purpose, but they do merge. And when you're working with offender profiling specifically, we pull from a lot of these different profiling techniques. So that's an overview of, of, of profiling and, and, and what it is, because if we don't understand what profiling is actually, then we kind of got nowhere to go. So it's really important to remember the different types and also identify how they link together. Um, just to focus specifically quickly on 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 um, on on offender profiling. Here we look a lot of the times usually at your crime scene analysis, your analysis of your victim, um, your behavioral analysis, your psychological profiling, also your demographic graphic profiling and your modus operandi versus your signature. The only one I'm going to really talk about um, right now is modus operandi versus signature. So in serial crime, it's really important to understand the two of them. We've gone through the rest, so I'm not going to draw that out. Um, modus operandi evolves as the offender learns new techniques. So he may start off doing something in a certain way, commit the crimes, learn, and then eventually he ends up finding the best possible way he can to commit his crime. And then his modus operandi will settle once he's sorted that out. But the signature is what's really, really interesting, especially in the case of serial crimes, such as murder and rape and arson. And what's interesting there is that the signature signifies the psychological need of that offender. What is the driver? So if you can identify the signature as a profiler early on in the case, you will understand the driver of the crime. And that never changes. That is the root of the crime. And that is basically the difference between modus operandi and signature. So our next sort of topic that we kind of wanted to address was the fundamental nature of crimes and, and has it remained constant? So I've been alive for 50 years, so I've kind of limited it to the last 50 years because I really can't give much personal experience before that. Um, but has it remained constant? Um, yes, I think when it comes to um, basically common law crime, it's definitely remained sort of cons constant uh, when you're looking at things like um, your fundamental, you, you know, your violent crimes, your property crimes and your white collar crimes. Um, crimes have remained fundamentally um, the same, sex crimes. The drivers are the same. If you look at things like murder, assault, robbery, they're the same. Most murders in South Africa happen when people get drunk in pubs. They're not really planned. Um, but the nature of planned criminality is vastly different from the way that it used to happen, which we'll, we'll also look at and explore. Um, property crimes like common law theft, burglary, vandalism remain common. We can see it every day. Um, but And we're always going to desire things. And if you don't have means, then you'll find a way to unlawfully uh, acquire property. Um, same as white collar crimes, embezzlement, insider trading, these types of things, they have remained the same. The motivations remain the same. A lot of the old modus operandi remain the same, but we do see an increase in the technical aspect. Then how has crime actually evolved? So when we look at the changed aspects, we need to look at things like the technology and 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 the cyber crime uh, issues. So we've got a lot of new forms of crime in cyber that we never had before, like hacking and phishing and ransomware attacks and these types of crimes that didn't exist anymore. In fact, I'm permanently dealing with sextortion matters. Um, okay, there's there's not 
much you can do with idiots that insist on sending photographs of their private parts to people. But I've got a client at the moment, for example, that's been extorted already for 1.4 million rand. Um, and, you know, he's now come to the realization that it's never going to end. And we are now opening the cases and dealing with it. And he's had to tell his wife. So there's a lot of these new forms of crime where um, social media is used and so on. Another thing that's very, very different is where crime used to be contained to an area in which the criminal actually physically was present. We now have much broader reach. So cybercrime allows perpetrators to target victims all over the world. And it's vastly expanding and the potential impact is enormous. And we are seeing especially pensioners and children um, being exploited the most because they lack the knowledge um, that they need to protect themselves. Um, another thing that's changed here is anonymity. Um, technology apply, you know, gives criminals um, anonymity and technology, I mean, sorry, gives criminals um, anonymity. And the more ways that you can conceal your identity and your operations, the more free you are to operate. Another thing where we've seen big changes um, since in the last little while is organized crime um, because we now have global networks and they're very sophisticated they're very well funded um, they're international and they involve areas like human trafficking drug trafficking uh, human smuggling organ trafficking um, you, you know the, the list just goes on and on and then of course all the scams and uh, here that takes us to the cyber syndicates who are also often very much organized groups, but you do get the lone wolf guys as well that just will figure out something and do it on their own. But they are well funded, they operate online, and they're very much dedicated to the scams, the credit card fraud, the online gambling, all of these types of crimes. And um, of course, the, 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 the crypto crimes and the crypto scams, which have hit South Africa very, very badly. Um, I'm seeing a lot of pensioners phoning me in desperation, um, having fallen prey to cryptocurrency scams. And uh, it's very sad, but even when you tell them they've been scammed, they don't want to believe you. Another area where crime has changed completely is in terrorism. Um, here we've got evolving ta tactics um, because they can teach each other. And that with the global interconnectivity, the terrorists have adapted. They employ cyber tools. They now function as lone wolves. They don't need massive structures anymore. And um, it's, um, it's changing. And also they have a much, much bigger um, propaganda, propaganda, um, um, access to, to propaganda to, to large crowds where they didn't have before they had to target you individually. Um, they're also very good at planning attacks and they do this on the dark web and on the on on, on various social media. We've seen the whole pla whole whole attacks planned on the dark web um, again because of the anonymity. And also money transfer is very easy for them um, online working in the cryptos. Um, another thing that we've seen evolve is lone wolf attacks um, because it's now so easy to be indoctrinated online. Um, we now have individual terrorism attacks inspired by extremist ideologies that, that really don't understand and um, rather than large coordinated groups. Um, another area that's, that's, that's very important to look at is the financial crime area. Here we've got digital fraud, we've got the rise of digital transactions like credit card fraud, identity theft, um, cryptocurrency, and these types, and all types of scams have increased. Um, and then, of course, it's becoming more complex. So we can look at things like com how complex are the schemes now. They are very intricate, and they span multiple countries. And they're becoming more and more difficult to profile because of the fact that AI is now actually writing the scam. So it's very difficult to actually even assess the language 
of the criminals in order to profile them because the chat GPT is actually writing the letters and um, it's it's making it very complicated for the profiles. Um, of course, drug related crimes have spiraled. Um, we now have the dark web and these huge online markets where we can sell drugs and plan the sale of the drugs and we have huge markets that are, can now be um, exercised and it's very difficult because one of the other challenges is the legalization and the regulation of drugs um, things like cannabis have become legal and it's shifted um, so and then it's very difficult to regulate these criminal markets which pop up and disappear um, really really quickly um, so you'll have a market that will appear on the dark web it'll be there for two or three weeks and then it will disappear and move to another forum so it's very difficult to monitor. Um, another area is environmental crimes. That's that's become um, increased. That's increased as well, especially things like wildlife trafficking and pollution-based crimes. Um, corporate responsibility. Well, we've seen that although corporates do take responsibility at times, and they they are regulated to uh, to avoid uh, environmental harm they simply don't in a lot of cases um, and i think this all of these changes are mainly due to globalization um, social movements advocating for civil rights and environmental protection and social justice have influenced the legal landscape and economic disparities because unfortunately if you are computer literate you have so many more opportunities than if you're you're not so in economic inequalities especially in south africa will always drive crime um right so in conclusion that's looking at the fundamental nature of crime um, remaining unchanged we can see that in some crimes yes it has remained fundamentally uh, unchanged but in others, it's changing and it's changing really, really quickly. Um, in fact, more so than people even realize. Um, what are the motivations for crime? As far as profiling goes, this is critical. So they're also the old traditional <laughs> perspectives on the motivations of crime and the modern perspectives on the motivations of crime. So in the old days, we always used to say, traditional crime, need or greed. Uh, you either had a need to survive and you committed your crimes to survive or you were under financial strain and you had economic hardship and you needed to survive and you would involve yourself in crimes like theft and burglary. Um, the need again uh, for survival, of course, a woman that's got to feed her children is going to steal a loaf of bread. Um, this is to be expected. So, of course, always important. And as far as greed goes, well, the desire for wealth is always going to be there. And the desire for power and status, again, um, we are never going to see this submit. So those would be your really old school need and greed type, um, type motivations. But what's happening in modern society? Well, it's kind of interesting because now we have to factor in the hackers and the others. And a lot of the hacking motivation is just thrill seeking. They want to commit crimes for excitement and out of a thrill and out of a challenge. It's like joyriding or vandalism for them. Um, they want to see how far they can go. And it's, it's actually really fun. And then the, from a psychological factor as well, we need to look at the psychopathy psychopathy, sociopathy, and narcissism, in my opinion, are all disorders that we are seeing increasing across populations globally. Um, there's a lack of empathy in people, there's impulsivity, there's a need for control, but most importantly, many of these people never meet their victims. So you're simply a number and an item to exploit. Um, so that's changed hugely. Um, what are, and then, of course, we've got social, socio-cultural influences. I think peer pressure plays a massive role, especially for young kids today. And um, 
you know, even for, for the public, if you actually speak the truth a lot of the time, you get pounced on by the ideological left-wing lunatics, commonly known as the work brigade. And we're not allowed to think freely. I mean, when you have influenced society to a point where people can't tell you what a woman is, then you know that it's gone too far because this is neuro-linguistic programming. If you are taught now, as modern society is, to disbelieve their own eyes, can you imagine how easy it is if you can manipulate that, which is a basic thing that we've known our whole lives, um, you can manipulate anyone into believing anything. And this is being used and weaponized against society today as we fall in, love, in line with these uh, young adults that are offended by everything and that have wanting to change language to get us to buy into their pronouns and can't decide what sex they are or gender they are. Well, yeah. Anyway, let me not get too far into that because it's a discussion all on its own. And then, of course, all of this is influenced by the media. Um, so it's very, very easy to attack people today. Um, and of course, as I said before, the media has increased things like identity theft and cyberbullying and hacking and all these types of things. And then I think we're seeing an increase in rebellion and protest as a, as a motivator because people are really just sick and tired of everything. And especially in South Africa, as soon as anything doesn't go well, we burn something down or we attack something or we have a riot or this is now the basically accepted norm of how, of conflict resolution. Um, but it's also spurred and, and, and spurred along by the internet and get, being able to get your message out so fast and change your targets and, and, and coordinate so much better. And then, of course, with the hackers, it's just fun. Like I said before, it's just fun. Um, and also with teenagers, shoplifting, for example, is just a thrill. It's for fun. So is recreational drug use. Um, so is risky sex. It's, it's just fun. And I think today with us living in such a crazy world, people are bored, especially the youth. And when you're bored, you learn how to do something that may not be so legal. So as you can see, there's, there's, there's quite a few differences in the motivations um, of old school crime and the motivations of modern crime. Another thing that we really need to be very, I'm not going to speak too long on this, but it is really important to understand the motivations of internal threat are again completely different to the motivations of external threat. So when we look at internal threat, we need to look at things like revenge, like a disgruntled employee wanting to get back at the company, like unhappy employees with unmet um, expectations or a lack of promotion. Um, they also do it for financial gain. Of course, that's always going to be a motive. Um, but dissatisfaction with company policies, gambling habits, drug habits, sex addictions, these all and a sense of entitlement which we see in, in increasing day by day are always our are, are, are motivations that we're going to see with insider threat. And we need to pay very particular interest to insider threat because remember, these guys already have the keys to your company. They are the best placed people to destroy your company from within. And our companies don't profile enough. You profile when you employ, but the continuous profiling of employees is not happening in most companies and neither is cybersecurity. So these are two big, big promoters of insider threat of which the most dangerous offender is your IT department because they speak a different language, they have control of everything, and usually your C-suite has no clue what they're doing or what they're talking about because they're not even speaking the same language. So with internal threat, you need to, well, here you're fortunate because the person is usually in your environment, except in COVID when they were working from home, uh, or you've got employees working from home, but you, there are behaviors you can look for, like how do they accept feedback? Are they having increased arguments with coworkers? 
Is their work performance dropping or poor? Is their discipline poor? How they're dealing with their anger management strategies? Are they aggressive to their supervisors? Um, are they disengaged? Um, are they dependent? Um, are they dependable? Are they showing any signs of depression or withdrawing? Are they more confrontational than they used to be? Um, is there emotional irritability? Um, and, the, and these are things that we need to look at. Are they showing increased stress? Have their circumstances changed? Are they getting divorced? Is there major um, changes happening in their life? We need to know what's happening in the lives of our employees, and we don't. And as soon as you suspect or you see any of these um, things happening, I suggest that you immediately limit the access rights of that individual to your systems. You have to operate from a zero trust perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, another really important thing to look at is hackers. All I want to say about hackers right now is that not all hackers are bad. Some hackers are really good guys. You've got the white hats, the gray hats, the red hats. I mean, there are six different types. Your most dangerous hacker, strangely enough, is your script kitty. And that's a young person that just runs code and has no idea what he's doing and kind of doesn't even understand the, 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 the process uh, of what he's doing and how much damage he can cause. Um, he's taking code that he hasn't written and he's running it. I'd much rather be attacked by a black hat or a red hat that knows what they're doing than by a script kitty. So that's another big evolution in crime. So how do we use um, offender profiling in investigations? In normal general investigations, we can use it for analyzing the crime scene, looking at behavior patterns, notice operandes, looking at the victim. How did they select the victim? How did they meet the victim? How did they interact with the victim? Your where or where are they operating from? So some ge geographic. What are the personalities? What is the stressor and the trigger in that person's life? So really important to understand that in both financial and in 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 other crimes. Where does it change? Another very important part where profiling is used is training. So we train law enforcement with a goal of increasing analytical skills, and of course teaching them proper interviewing and interrogation strategies. Interrogation, I know it's a swear word. Okay, so we'll stick with interview techniques. Um, so, And also what's really important, both financially and in other crimes, is to simulate exercises, get people used to working with real cases, and then retroactively have a look at the cases that have happened to you and do the case studies and understand what happened so that you can use it preventatively in the future. And also really important for to with training to have interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. So you've got to run workshops, you've got to run seminars, and you've got to continue education. The way we're working with tech today, huh, you have to move with the times. If you don't upskill, you will die as a business. And that I can not stress more strongly. Um, how do we also use profiling in research? Well, yes, of course, there's empirical studies. We can model behavior and pr to predict behavior, and we can understand criminal behavior using long longitudinal studies and comparative analysis to do that. Um, and then another really useful um, uh, thing to think about when you're doing research is you can take that research that you've done and you can use it to improve your policy and your practices. Um, so your best practices and also you can also look at your ethical considerations, which are changing daily as we have more and more access to different 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 people's data. Um, so as a conclusion, as you can see, it has various applications. But the main ones are investigation, training, and research. Those are where we primarily use it. Um, from a financial perspective, um, how, how do we use it? Um, the same sort of thing, also identifying modus operandi, behavior. But what's quite interesting in financial is we can use link analysis. So we can do connection mapping. 
um, where we can look at the connections between individuals, businesses, how they transact, where they transact. And this helps us to uncover networks. Um, network analysis is also very much very useful in financial uh, profiling, where you can identify your criminal networks, who's your key players, who's your facilitators, who the peripheral me members, and who are possibly the internal threat. Um, we also look at the psychology that that drives it. Is it desperation, greed, fun? Why are they doing it? And it also helps us to do risk tolerance. So once we can assess the offender's tolerance for risk, that will influence the frequency and the scale of their crimes. So by understanding the psychology, we can ascertain what will, will they escalate, will they de-escalate, and what measures we need to put into place. Of course, again, we can use the bank statements and the withdrawals from, from uh, ATMs and so on to identify the geographic side, the potential hotspots, and the origins of criminal behavior um, as far as physical locations go, where the bank's being hit and so on. Um, <clears throat> and then again, we have to learn from our past uh, crimes um, analytically, what do we have to look at here? Financial institutions have huge amounts of data, so analytics is really important. And then, of course, um, it's really important to teach financial investigators to interrogate, to elicit information without raising suspicion, because in some cases we want those people to continue um, with the actual with the crime so that they can be tracked. Um, again. In order to do this, you need to simulate investigations. You need to engage in role-playing sort of activities where we can get the investigators to play the criminals and the analysts to play the investigator so that we can understand the strategies as, and the perspectives of offenders as they evolve. Um, again, we have to keep training because things are evolving so fast. Um, and then, of course, we need to understand the offender typologies that are engaging in the financial side, as well as the crime life cycle. And that's really important, looking at the what does the life cycle of this financial crime look at? How is it planned? How is it executed? And um, how, are, how is that gain potentially reinvested? So those are all really important um, methods to use um, and then finally, what I'd like to talk about is in enhanced due diligence. This is really important in the in the financial sector. You have to do profile, customer profiling to actually be able to do advanced due diligence, and you have to do background checks. And, and I'm not talking about a criminal records check because there's no point. Three quarters of the criminals in South Africa never get convicted. So you've got to use your social media, your public records, your databases, um, your transaction monitoring tools, um, and look in real time what's happening as well as for those behavioral identifiers that I've given you. And that allows us to do fraud detection through predictive modeling and, of course, anomaly um, uh, anomaly detection. And more and more we're having to use things like machine learning to detect anomalies um, in transaction data because there's just too much data to work with. And also then finally for the finance side, AML compliance and reporting mechanisms. So as you can see, things are changing really, really quickly. Um, we have to build open source intelligence capacity. And this is the thing that is worrying me the most because we have multiple um, layers of the internet which are being exploited by criminals worldwide. We have the clear net, the deep web, and the dark net all at play. And we've got to begin to understand what are the sources being used by these people? How are they, what techniques are they using? What sort of applications are they using? And what tools are available? And we've got to start investing as business in these, in the tools that are going to help us to fight these types of offenders, because this is increasing and increasing and increasing. And just to give you an idea, 
the tools on the clear net are your social media, your public records, your news articles, your forums, um, your discussion boards. They're using techniques like web scraping and keyword monitoring and link analysis and sentiment analysis. And it's all being used to do background checks and threat assessments and market research. And on the deep web, it's a whole different ball game because they're selling the databases on the deep web. So you've got the, you could buy academic and state databases. In fact, the South African Defense Force database is sitting on the dark web as is Experian. So we've got to understand the different sources um, and, and how to combat the new wave of crime. But it's expensive. Um, so what we've done as a company is we're developing some reasonably placed web scrapers and, and profiling tools. Um, we've got a program called Vicecat. We've got another one called Mr. Holmes. And we've recently developed Darkus which is specifically designed to hunt dark web um, sources and dark web content and quickly because the most of the dark web crawlers are very, very slow. But Darkus is very quick and effective and has very good reporting structures. So this is where we're going. We have to upskill. We've got to keep going. Offender profiling can be used in every single aspect of business, and it should be used. And as the world becomes more complex, the need for offender profilers is growing daily. Um, and we're going to face challenges. Of course we are. But, um, you know, we've got to adapt. Profiling tools are going to have to start looking at um, AI uh, deep fake de detection, a whole bunch of interdisciplinary col collaboration with cybersecurity expertise and forensic specialists. Um, we're going to have to do continuous training. We're going to have to look at the legal and ethical frameworks. Um, these are just things that are going to become part of our everyday lives. And we have to make, as the financial sector, as even everyday people the commitment to protecting our data and making sure that we understand the evolving world um, around us and try to keep pace with it and it's becoming increasingly difficult and with that i'm going to close thank you so much for your attention and for being here i hope it was informative and if you have any questions i'm here to take them sorry thank you excuse me <coughs> I'm still recovering from a cold I brought back from China about two and a half weeks ago. And my voice keeps disappearing. Um, Des Hedegaard Bowman asked a question. He says, does profiling have consequences for the person being profiled in the sense that they may suffer discrimination in the level of service received by the organization? Well, with the person being profiled, there can be comebacks, but it depends on the ethics and the methodology used in the profiling. So if there's profiling bias or the profiler is operating from a point of bias, but if they are purely working with objective data, which they are formulating, I mean, yes, they're going to have consequences. I have at the moment a case where I had a CV of a young girl and um, through open source intelligence techniques, we have basically disproved the entire CV. Not only that, but her husband who worked for the Polish embassy was the person who made the recommendations for her to Interpol and various um, organizations which allowed her to get work with Interpol, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police, the Drug Enforcement Agency and so on. And these are all based on fraudulent references. So, Yes, there will definitely be consequences to an individual being profiled if it's found that that individual has um, committed CV fraud, for example, or is involved in, in crime. Um, they're going to face the consequences of prosecution. I don't think that's profiling. I think that's proper due diligence. Um, to me, profiling but it's is... Also I, I, it's I also profiling. I understand why you um, say what you're saying, but um, the the tools that you use to get that 
are profiling tools. I get that. Or the tools you, the same tools that you use for profiling. I get that. But what you're doing there is not looking to build a a profile of that person in the sense that it's a psychological profile. You're not looking to see whether this person is likely to do this, that, or the other. But you are saying this person is demonstrably a dishonest person, and so are the people around her. Is that truly yes, a profile? Is that a or is well, that just a it, it is it, it is a profile depending if, if this had been done as a profiling exercise um where on application for positions which unfortunately it wasn't um which had rather severe consequences but if the profiler is objective and clear and unbiased the person being profiled should not actually suffer consequences um or unfair consequences let's not say consequences because i think there are always consequences any action that we do in the world has consequences but if the the the, the profile is built objectively remember what i said in the beginning we we try to exclude in criminal profiling rather than include so we profile in, 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 in profiling that's done to identify offenders, I know that the TV programs say that it's done to pinpoint the finger at so-and-so, but it's not. It's done to exclude a certain demographic from having been able to have participated in the crime, thereby narrowing the actual suspect pool. And you can narrow significantly, almost down to the person um but again it all depends on the qualifications ethics legislation um and protections for the public that should be conscientiously uh, implemented by anybody with profiling ability that is worth their ethical salt i think that possibly what des was getting at is the idea that if a person is profiled as being xenophobic or um, in some way personality is, is undesirable, should that be a reason that the um, that an organization would say, we're not going to provide you with banking services, for example? Well, definitely, I wouldn't say your personality should exclude you from banking services, for example. Um, because we we would have to exclude half the managing directors of companies in that case because Absolutely. they all show psychopathic traits. Well, one of the things that <laughs> it's, part of, it's part of doing business. <laughs> but if somebody is profiled as having a a history of fraud, for example, and you know that fraud is going to occur in your bank if you allow this person, he's going to money launder, he's going to use your bank to his 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 um his benefit and and in order to defraud other people, then yes, um I would most definitely exclude him from owning a bank account. I would not want that person associated in my organization. Alternatively, I can accept him, but monitor his transactions very carefully. So that, that would be up to the director of, of, of that organization to make that call. That was exactly the approach that we adopted when we created risk values in 2001. Um, and the idea was that we would say, this is, an, this is a person that you should look at more closely or on a more regular basis, um, rather than to deny them services. Um, interestingly, a great deal of what you said your products are now doing is exactly what we designed risk values to do all those years ago. Um, and yet banks and indeed um, the, the technology companies that were providing services to banks flatly refused to use it because they said, if our customers find out that we are doing psychological profiling on them, then there's going to be uproar. And so after five years of trying to sell it and failing to get it even, even in testing in a single financial institution, we gave up with it. Um, and so now, 15 years on, it, it's, it's almost required, which is, which is quite fascinating. Can I go to the, um, the thing where we, you and I have a dispute um, over whether <laughs> it's dangerous? See, I'm, I'm very much um, of the opinion, 
as I have been since the 1990s, that crime doesn't change. Um, what changes the delivery mechanisms? So if we look at, for example, confidence tricks, it's gone from um, the idea of scratching a number or an accounting fraud confidence trick, scratching a number on a, on a piece of, uh, of clay to lie about the number of sheep that are going through a gate all the way through many different forms of printing um, and ultimately putting information on a computer screen. It's all, people are, are sucked in by the latest technology, but the crime doesn't, doesn't change. The crime is still, I want you to believe this lie so that you act to your detriment. And however that's delivered, the fundamental remains the same in my view. It does and it doesn't because you don't have to do anything to be hacked. You don't have to make any action to be hacked. All you have to do is not have sufficient cybersecurity. So you can end up today in a circumstance where I see it as fundamentally different is with the cyber component. Yes, there's still, a, as I said, there's still all the fundamental aspects that apply, but the actual mechanisms that are used to affect crimes and the increase in the vulnerability of people that are uninformed, um, and that's 90% of people are uninformed. Um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to take any action. You don't have to do anything wrong. You can be randomly selected or just your name pulled off a database and well, attacked for true, no they, reason whatsoever. This is no different to when you're sitting at home watching TV and somebody knocks on your door and says, I've noticed you've got a hole in the roof um, and uh, I could fix it for you. It's it's still the same random selection. Uh -uh, it well, isn't because you would have to open the door, interact and allow him in. Here you don't have to. Well, Here you have to, there, there's no interaction whatsoever. You're randomly selected by someone you've never met in your life who has randomly done something or found something um and and it decided to exploit it there's so, no so action wondering. required by the person other than buying a smartphone or a computer it's burglary then, isn't it? it's still, still fundamentally it's burglary but i have to say and it is, way, and back it is. The, way back in the 1990s when i declared there is no such thing as cybercrime which i still which i still say um i did say if there is a cybercrime if there is a cybercrime then the only cybercrime is hacking because there is a yes. difference between yes. that i would i would i would agree with that because the scams you have to do something you have to be taken in so the basics of fraud would be proponents of that the methodologies have definitely changed but as far as but, hacking but then also, goes if we, nothing. if we look at the the idea that effectively um breaking into your computer is 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 using an electronic jemmy um, it's it's just basically someone who's using a crowbar to break open a window to get in to steal the clock off your mantelpiece or whatever. Um, the from the from from the point of view of the actual global conduct, it remains the same. But I also back in the 1990s highlighted the or not highlighted drew attention to the fact that people commit crime because they need something a proper need, an actual need, because they want something um, or because they just do it because they can. There's an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's to me fascinating that we're now, what, best part of 30 years after I was writing that, and this is still the analysis um, to say that the need or greed or just the hell of it, um, which is um, a, uh, it, it's, again, comes back in my in my mind to say we are busy telling people to pay attention to the exciting stuff but we're not teaching them the real fundamentals of what criminals do because most crime can be identified by pattern, pattern analysis by the Absolutely. victim and so we're Absolutely. doing, we're doing a, we're doing a disservice to the world at large all the old people all the young people um and people like me and you, who get caught by fraudsters because we're not paying attention, not because they're doing anything particularly clever, 
Um, but it's true that the technology makes it easier, it makes it a lot easier. The um, anonymity that, um, that, that again, has been present since the 1990s, that anonymity has not improved, and it can be improved. The, 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 there are ways within the internet that, that can make anonymity much more difficult, but it's not oh, yes. in the interest of, the, of governments and it's not in the interest of, of the big companies to do it. Um, and so we see campaigners saying, you we should be doing this, we should be doing that, but nobody ever does anything about it. Why well, do you, think that you see, this is this. I, I have a my own. Please don't slaughter me for this because I have my own feeling about that, especially when it comes to South Africa. I don't believe there's any political will to combat crime, and I, I'll tell you why. Uh, in the first place, um, the politicians are all committing crimes, so they don't really want to. They would have to build. Yeah, 90%. Generality 90%. Um, the ANC cabinet, if you go through the ministers, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you they're all involved in something or another, without exception. So um, that, that is a problem. So there's no political will. Then the other problem is, is that crime has created an industry. Hmm. So if, the, if you combat crime effectively, and you actually build your police force up to combat crime effectively in South Africa, you will no longer have a need for all these security companies and private security guards. You could halve them if the police actually did their job and they appointed somebody with half a brain to be the minister of police. Um, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. That gives you the indication, just the fact that Becky Tele is in charge of the South African police, tells you there's no will to combat crime um, politically because he wouldn't be there if, if, if there was. So this is the problem. You've got to create a will to combat crime uh, from the elites that are, are profiteering, the po politicians that are profiteering, the security guards. If you combat crime in South Africa, you lose millions of jobs, millions, because crime drives the South African economy. At every level, from the from from mining, from the top to the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, but but I don't think that South Africa is unusual in that. I mean, I think that we can look at um, at many countries around the world. I mean, I, I've just been looking at. Um, an absolutely shocking case in the States where 20-something um, children of age 13 have been found using very dangerous machinery in slaughterhouses. Um, and uh, you would think that this is illegal, but actually it's not. Well, using the dangerous machinery is described as illegal, but it's only dealt with by civil cases. So it appears to be unlawful rather than illegal. And secondly, um, the employment of these children is not unlawful or illegal. It's only because they were using the dangerous machinery. And I, I find it unfathomable that in a country where they are saying, hey, China, you can't put people to work in factories because, it's, because that's inappropriate, that they've got their own children working in, these fa in, in similar factories or indeed in conditions that are, are potentially even worse and even more dangerous. Um, I don't think that we can identify South Africa specifically as being effectively a, a nation of criminals because I think that the leader of the free world is every bit as bad and so is everywhere else. Um, <laughs> this is exactly the, the, the conversation I have. Everybody says to me, well, why don't you immigrate? <laughs> I'm going like, to where? What, where? <laughs> where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> At least we have good weather here. We have criminality. We have good weather. And you, you know what? Fundamentally, I think most South Africans understand the project, uh, you know, the, the, the circumstances we live in, and we can defend against it. So in South Africa, your defense is to become independent, your, for your existence to become independent of the government. 
So you need to have solar, you need to have a water filtration system, and you need to be able to have enough high walls and security deterrence not to need to go to the police. Because there's no point in going to the police. Um, they are so embedded in, in, in the crime in South Africa. I mean, if you go to the police, you'll get a notification from a policeman trying to extort you to tell you that there's somebody that's actually opened a counter case against you and it'll happen within three or four days so or your car's been found that you've reported stolen and you need three thousand rand to get it back you know so south africa has a very unique i mean if a policeman phones you just run away if anybody i mean they are literally a crime syndicate um so it is a very unique environment um, and that's why I say it's important for businesses who want to survive to become independent their functioning needs to be independent of requiring the policing system because reporting a case to the police is where that case goes to die that that, that is literally it. it you will be more frustrated than that by having to deal with these people then you will be by actually getting on with it and just you know moving on with your life where you so can why, actually start rebuilding. why would any honest businessman stay in south africa well in my opinion again uh, and I, I don't want to involve my company in my personal opinion but in my personal opinion um only an only old people and idiots will stay in south africa or people that are benefiting off of the the rampant crime um will stay with security company owners and so on this is not a environment for investment in my opinion at the moment unless something critical is done and i can see mass exodus from the country as well now because even we now even have this equally corrupt opportunity of the national health insurance plan uh, being signed into law which is just creating more opportunity for the ANC to steal and this is their modus operandi it has been since day one and it will be until they exit and we have an election coming up hopefully people work vote a little bit with a brain and less with um, past allegiances in the interests of building a strong and resilient future for this country because otherwise we are finished does that ever happen in a developing country or in or for that matter in a former former colonial country um, we I are seeing of... shifts okay we are seeing shifts um i see shifts on the ground i see very frustrated people um I see a future in South Africa. It's my country. I'm not having the likes of certain politicians come in and tell me I must go back to Europe. I've never been in Europe. I've never lived in Europe. Um, my ancestors have been here for 300 years. So, um, you know, for some Zimbabwean to come into my country and tell me to get out and go back to Europe, I find it absolutely abhorrent. So, you know what? We have to stay and fight for our country. Our country is worth fighting for, I believe we need to strengthen all our systems and we need to raise awareness um well, and we need to profile as i said in my introduction one of the things that i've noticed when i've been in south africa is that the the problems that people talk about the the petty violent the petty interracial violence in particular that seems to be on a case-by-case -case basis it doesn't seem to be institutionalized um i mean I, I, i've done things which people say they would not dare do and i'm i i was um uh at a, at a meeting organized by one of the, the large accountancy firms in johannesburg and i'd got on a train from pretoria um and i got off the train i'd got in a minibus to get to my hotel and <clears throat> there was a, a a an accountant who happened to be black um who said i would not dare do that I said, well, you're part of the problem then, aren't you? I got on I got on the train and they were pleased to see me. When I got on the bus, they were pleased to see me. This is not it's what you're not, telling me the country is like. I don't see the problem as being on the ground. 
in when everyday people in South Africa have everyday conversations with be they black, white, Indian, purple, green, I don't really care. I see people as people. I've always done that my entire life. I've never considered myself well, I am white, I suppose. I can't get away from that. Um I don't identify as anything else either. <laughs> so, um, you know, I I am what I am. But I don't see the problem on the ground. Wherever I go, people ask me for help. I interact with all races, all people, all classes, all social economic um, classes, um, all education levels. And I have never seen a person say to me, I won't use you because you're what? Or I have never seen a person just say, well, I won't interact with this person because they're black. This is not a person to person. This is a politically motivated, concerted effort to split people through race and cause um, these these rifts because they can be exploited politically and economically. And it, this is done by a deviant political class and the elites. I mean, we see this in every forum. Corruption is rewarded. And it's not just South Africa. Look at the West. I mean, I'm not pro-Russian. Please don't interpret what I'm going to say as pro-Russian. But Ukraine is a disaster area as far as corruption goes. And yet the West is supporting them. For what? They're a disaster. So you know what the problem is, is when you make crime viable and profitable, you will have crime. And when you support the criminal elite, no matter from what country they are, you will have a growth in criminal behavior. And when there are no consequences, like there are none in South Africa because the justice system is so eroded and state capture and cater deployment and everything else that we have here, um, you will have problems. And we do. And it's, it, it's, it's because of this. People need to find their ethical compass and their moral compass, which seems to have gone out the window. Um, so if, and I'm not if, talking about South Africa, I'm talking about the world. I, I agree, absolutely. So if we're now looking to say that we want to be able to identify types of people rather than individuals, perhaps, um, who are likely to be committing a certain type of crime, are we simply going to say, well, the politician left with a criminal? Isn't that too broad a brush to, to, to apply? Well, show me... Okay, maybe not a criminal, but show me one that isn't at least a liar, because you know well, I can't possible. find one. Yeah. yeah, you know it's 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 kind of, and from there where does it go? So you're dealing with a morally defunct person just from the lying perspective, and then when they discover the economic gain that they can they can um, they can garner from from that dishonesty, the dishonesty grows and without consequences and without anybody taking responsibility for anything and without no prosecutions, um, it will increase. That's just the nature. We have no role models in South Africa because the one lot is as defunct as the other lot. I mean, we have to go and vote. I don't know who to vote for because they're all idiots. I love this. To be honest. <laughs> um, you, you said about psychological profiling being using the traits to predict behavior. Um, so how does that fit in with predictive policing? Well, predictive policing is, again, as you said, for me, it's, it's, it's pattern analysis. For me, predictive policing is pattern analysis. If you have strong, it's not psychological profiling, it's, it's it's criminological profiling through pattern analysis, and that will give you predictability. Um, so it's who's there, who, if there's a, a need, and there's an opportunity, and there's a vulnerability, that is your perfect storm. Um, and until we start using proper pattern analysis and now please don't do this um there's there's predictive policing is impossible 
um, on offender profiling, a serial murderer, for example, well, there's predictive. A serial killer can't change. He's driven by his needs and his needs are his needs. And even when he's 70 years old, he will still be driven by those needs. And he will just change his victim demographic, possibly, if that's not the signature. Um, so he will target weaker victims, less able to defend themselves. And we see that with 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 uh, financial profiling as well. If you, we are seeing pensioners targeted. Why pensioners? Because pensioners are the most computer illiterate people in the com in the in the country. They still believe your word is your honor. There's no such thing as honor in cybercrime. There's no such thing as 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 you know, as, as reality almost, uh, they don't understand the environment and this makes them a target. And we see this not only in the US, but in South Africa, we see pensioners using their entire, losing their entire life savings to these people. We see them scammed. And then when you tell them they've been scammed, they'll still borrow a fr from a friend to try to fix the scam. I see it in my 90 year old uncle. He's scammed every six months, at least. There's some, I mean, the other day, somebody was selling a car online, so he bought it, and then they needed the tax, and then it was the next thing. So it's essentially fraud, but it's it's targeted at pensioners, and especially crypto. They don't understand crypto, so they can't go and invest in crypto by simply going and getting a Binance account or a Coinbase account and learning the basics because they don't understand the basics. So they then a target for an investor to then say to them, well, give me your money. I'll invest it in crypto, never to be seen again. So these are the types of, you know, it's 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 profiling of the actual situation. And that's how we have to uh, to close down crime. Behavioral analysis, situational analysis. The example it's of that type of profiling. The example you've just given of crypto, that's just Bernie Madoff. It's, it's yeah, okay, so they're calling it crypto, it but, it, but it could just be, this is a this is a, a, a an asset class that I'm specializing in. You don't need to understand that asset class, just give me your money. Exactly, and the problem is also laziness. You know, when some, and, and it's, it's not just laziness, it's laziness and being overwhelmed. I think what I see with with people of my mom's age who I had to shout at in the middle of the, she doesn't realize that a computer speaker can pick up her talking in a bedroom, for example. She just doesn't get it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they, they don't yeah, understand. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> the, the, the tech, um, they don't understand the tech. And it's overwhelming because there's information coming at us in modern society from everywhere. Three quarters of it is either disinformation or misinformation. I don't believe at all in this term malinformation, which I think is the biggest joke in history. But in, 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 let me not even go on there. How can you tell the truth and that be done to spread malice? I'm sorry, the truth is the truth. And it's not your truth or my truth or anything else. There is the truth. That is the only truth. The truth. Um, all of the social skewing great, of the truth. There's a great deal in common. With, a great deal in common with what you've said at various points in this, with um, my work in understanding suspicion. And one of the things that um, I was quite gratified to hear you say is that we cannot avoid using racial, or actually I would go beyond that and say religious uh, and other profiling, um, because it is an essential part of somebody's makeup. And one of the things that we know is that people will inherently trust people like them. So we see intra-community crime, be it on a national basis or be it uh, on, on a religious basis, you know, that, that must be a good person because he goes to the same church as me. Um, and that is something that we really have to be able to get over so that we can say there, there are no no-go areas. We have to be able to look at every aspect of somebody's life if we're going to be able to understand them. And we need to understand them, otherwise we can't risk manage them. But it has to be done objectively. And I think this is the problem when you enter the field. I mean, I'm 
a person, I, I love to hear other people's viewpoints. So I'm completely open. I have my very solid opinions, which are difficult to change, but they're not impossible to change. So, I mean, this is, the, the, this is, this is a, such a fundamental thing is objectivity, the openness to consider something else. Now, when you just gave the example on the church, it, when we deal with human trafficking cases or predatorial type offenses where children are targeted, the church, funnily enough, and schools are one of the first places that we look because predators go where the prey is found, the prey of choice. So we've had a number of cases in South Africa, for example, where we've had youth pastors involved in predatorial behavior. And that is something that you're going to have to consider again with profiling. So you need to look at type of crime versus, versus geographics or location. Let's not say geographics because there's also internet. So a person that's looking for opportunity to exploit financial uh, institutions is going to go and work in a financial institution. He's got the keys. <laughs> You've given him the keys if you haven't done the proper profiling, the background checks and everything else. So you need to really, really take your crime, look at where's your victim pool situated. I mean, if I was predatorial, for example, I would go and visit all the old age homes. And I would offer fantastic investment opportunities online to all the Will. pensioners who have Will no watch. clue. We'll watch it. You know, I mean, so you've got to look at victim pool versus location versus opportunity again. And that's why I say the situational analysis profiling for me is what will stop crime. You've got to look at circumstances at victim at offender at need at greed at even for example with hijacking um is that person vulnerable does he have bodyguards um is there a route in and a route out um you know it all of these things play roles um no criminal commits crime with the objective of ending up in prison um so he's going to do a certain amount of training, uh, uh, I mean, of planning. So unless, as I said, it's a brawl in a bar fight and you end up with assault or too much alcohol involved or, or something of that nature or drugs, they don't plan. That just happens. Um, but when it's planned criminality, it's not impossible to start looking at vulnerable populations versus opportunity versus potential offender. And it's it's not that difficult to do, but people don't do it. Companies are not profiling. They're not reprofiling every six months, which they should be doing because people that's, change. That's, the person I employed today doesn't work for me in six months time. That's true. But the, the problem is always going to be that if you're going to subject your, your workforce Everyone that screws the gear knobs on at fraud up to the uh, the CEO um, of, um, of of the organisation. If you're going to profile them every six months, then someone sooner or later is going to think there's something wrong with the company that it doesn't trust its staff. No, you won't. You'll be profiling them automatically. For example, if somebody is committing some sort of computer crime or theft. You'll see behaviors. For example, they never leave their computer. They don't take their lunch. They come in early. They go late. Just your, just by reviewing your clock in logs, you're actually profiling. When did he get here? When did he leave? Why didn't he take his lunch? Why doesn't he take his tea? Why doesn't he ever leave his computer? Why is he addicted to this? What's going on here? This is abnormal. Why does, for me, any behavior change is a symptom. If somebody deviates from their norm, there's trouble a brewing and your workforce is your greatest threat but also your best security to, to, uh, tool so if you have a trust relationship and you can build a trust relationship between your security staff and your employees 
and open the door for them with safe reporting policies, you will have an incredible security team in your workforce. Because you don't tell the manager, I've got a problem. You tell the guy sitting next to you. You know, uh, it, the guy sitting next to you can see you sitting on the gambling sites all day. Why aren't you monitoring your network? Why aren't you closing down these things? Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is my point. Profiling is about situational awareness. That's what it is. It's situational awareness. You can see, I mean, I had a case in a bank, in a bank where a guy got on to the bank network and downloaded two terabytes worth of TV series from the Pirate Bay over a three month period. A bank. We had somebody who, <laughs> the day she so started she working for us, went through the <laughs> induction process, which included very, very clear instructions. You do not download anything onto your PC and you do not use any um, online sites which are active, like, for example, um, Yahoo Mail or whatever. Um, half yes, an hour later, just running, half an hour yeah. later, she installed Yahoo Messenger. So yeah. she wondered why five minutes later she'd been fired. <laughs> well, this is this, this is the thing. Um, if people can't follow rules, but again, it's it's not people will always take the gap we have to understand that it's human nature people will always take the gap if the gap is there um it's free data it's whatever whatever the gap is they're going to take it and if you're a big corporate you should be running software such as sentinel one for example that monitors behavior and is a good you know you should have the tools in place um you should be doing that if you're a small little cyber company or you're a small little 10 person company cyber security specifically is beyond most people's reach it's too expensive it's yeah. over regulated now that's another big contributor to crime is that south africa has an average iq of 72 Okay, that's not rocket scientists. That's documented. Oh, know, you can I'm look sorry. it up anyway. 70, 72. 72, okay, is the average no. IQ in South Africa. So technically so, bordering on idiot? Is that the... Is that unprosecuted, the yes, bordering on unprosecutable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the average IQ in South Africa is 72. Botswana is also around there. They, you know, all these southern African countries are sort of around about the same, between 70 and 72. The average IQ of a 17-year-old, so a child in South Africa today and on some longitudinal studies has shown that the child's IQ actually decreased by seven points between the age of 11 and 16, which is remarkable in itself. But now you're dealing with an average IQ of 72. So, you know what? I'm not saying that this is bad or it's good or it's anything, but that is scientifically, the data is there. How do you teach these people to protect themselves? You have to go down to grassroots level and actually explain to them. And nobody takes the time to do this, especially the vulnerable, especially the people sitting in the rural districts where they don't have access to information. They, they, they just don't have it. How do you change anything unless you upgrade education? And there's no, there's no um, political will to do that either. We've seen the education system collapsing in South Africa. It's, it's, a, it's a fact. Um, it, it's, it's a problem. Textbooks go missing. They don't get to their schools. There's so much corruption. It's like health. It's like everything. So one step after the next. But how do you even, in, in, in a lot of these cases, explain to them cybersecurity? How do you actually get a, a guy that started a company that needs to comply to data security standards 
to even understand that legislation. That's part of the problem, in my opinion. Legislation needs to be written, not for lawyers, so that Joe Soak, with his IQ of whatever, can pick that thing up and read it and understand it. You cannot comply with legislation that you don't even understand. And this is another thing about profiling. If you wrote the le legislation to, to be readable and understandable to the demographic that you're dealing with, you would have a far greater will and a far greater buy-in from businesses or small businesses to protect their data in an affordable way. But they don't understand the law. I and and which, who, who of them have got 20,000 Rand to go and see a lawyer? None of them. So you can't even pay somebody to go and get when you're a, a little startup business. It's, and, it's, and, it's, and this is the problem. Because it's not, it's not just the complexity, it's the volume. I have one last question because we're approaching the end mm -hmm. of our time. With all of what you said so far, and given that most of this is orientated towards protecting the organization and society, I have an overriding feeling of paranoia. Is that fair? Are we all being driven me? to bots? Are we no, not you, me. Are we all being driven <laughs> to the point where we are we are now so scared of what might happen that we that we end up effectively in deers in the headlights? I think that paranoia is setting in uh, globally. I don't think this is just a South African problem. I think it's globally. And I think it's due to the fact that nobody knows what to believe. So you, as I said, um, information is so complex and people are afraid. I mean, mo you know, you've got the you've got two types of people. You've got the stick your head in the sand ostrich type person who just really doesn't care, doesn't know and just rolls along and isn't paranoid and doesn't read anything and doesn't watch the news or doesn't do anything. And then you've got the people that are actually taking cognizance of the globalization and the WHO and the moves to, to take over state control of health and various things. And, and that these people are growing. If you look at the number of subscriptions to social media, alternate independent journalist uh, websites um, and, and, and blogs and, and podcasts, you will see that there is a remarkable shift in people that don't trust the le legacy media at all. All information is sought from alter alternate um, sources now. So the legacy media, the public has lost all trust. So how do you even get a message to people to alleviate their, their, um, their concerns? You can't because nobody trusts anybody anymore. And in well, South Africa, you shouldn't trust anybody. Well, sadly, we see that not just in South Africa, but but all over the place, don't we? It's um, some. Well, let's say pleasure. the trust should never exclude the control. So you can trust. Just make sure you've got control. <laughs> Laurie <laughs> Peters James, it's been an absolute pleasure and a great discussion in addition to a fascinating presentation. Um, as I said, we, we will be getting the presentation from Candice um, uh, separately, which will be added into the um, into the broadcast version via FinCrime TV. Um, and um, uh, once I've got Laurie's um, written confirmation that we can use this, then an edited version of, um, of, of what we've done so far today will also be incorporated in that. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Laurie, very much for um, a, a fascinating company. And I'm, I'm quite sure we will be having many hours of chats like this when other people aren't watching. Laurie, thank you very much. And to everybody else, thank you and goodbye. And thank you for sticking around, everybody, and for your time and, and ears. <laughs> Have a good evening or afternoon. Bye. Okay, recording is off. Um, oh, so, too bad. Yeah. my God, I thought that was a, that's two hours, and that was really far, well, very nearly two hours. That was really fast. I know. I hope it was okay, the presentation. I hope you're happy. I'm fascinated. I, I have got 
Oh, hang on. I can't see the, the numbers on the bottom. I've got six pages of notes. She won't need them. I'll send you the date. I actually left out quite a couple of slides because we I expanded on a couple of concepts I wasn't going to. But, um, yeah, I think I hope people take some of it. You know, I'm... I've given up on fighting with with the woke crowd. Uh, I, I really, I, I, I've gotten to the point now where I say what I think and I think what I say. I mean, I know the statistic of. Um, Des Hedegaard Bowman asked a question. He says, "Does profiling have consequences for the person being profiled in the sense that they may suffer discrimination in the level of service received by the organisation?" Well. <laughs> With the person being profiled, there can be comebacks, but it depends on the ethics and the methodology used in the profiling. So if there's profiling bias or the profiler is operating from a point of bias, but if they are purely working with objective data, which they are formulating, I mean, yes, they're going to have consequences. I have at the moment a case where I had a CV of a young girl and um, through open source intelligence techniques, we have basically disproved the entire CV. Not only that, but her husband, who worked for the Polish embassy, was the person who made the recommendations for her to Interpol and various um, organizations, which allowed her to get work with Interpol, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and so on. And these are all based on fraudulent references so yes there will definitely be consequences to an individual being profiled if it's found that that individual has um, committed cv fraud for example or is involved in in crime um, they're going to face the consequences of prosecution i don't think that's profiling i think that's proper due diligence um to me profiling is also I, I, it's I also profiling. I understand why you um, say what you're saying, but um, the the tools that you use to get that are profiling tools. I get that. Or the tools you the same tools that you use for profiling. I get that. But what you're doing there is not looking to build a a profile of that person in the sense that it's a psychological profile. You're not looking to see whether this person is likely to do this, that, or the other. But you are saying this person is demonstrably a dishonest person and so are the people around her. Is that true? Yes, or is that a, or is well, that just an it, it, is a, it is a profile depending, if, if this had been done as a profiling exercise um, where on application for positions, which unfortunately it wasn't, um, which had rather severe consequences. But if the profiler is objective, and clear and unbiased, the person being profiled should not actually suffer consequences um, or unfair consequences. Let's not say consequences because I think there are always consequences. Any action that we do in the world has consequences. But if the, 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 the profile is built objectively, remember what I said in the beginning, we, we try to exclude in criminal profiling rather than include. So we profile in, 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 in profiling that's done to identify offenders. I know that the TV programs say that it's done to pinpoint the finger at so-and-so, but it's not. It's done to exclude a certain demographic from having been able to have participated in the crime, thereby narrowing the actual suspect pool and you can narrow significantly almost down to the person um but again it all depends on the qualifications ethics legislation um and protections for the public that should be conscientiously uh, implemented by anybody with profiling ability that is worth their ethical fault i think that possibly what Des was getting at is the idea that if a person is profiled as being xenophobic or um, in some way 
personality is, is undesirable. Should that be a reason that the um, that an organization would say, we're not going to provide you with banking services, for example? Well, definitely, I wouldn't say your personality should exclude you from banking services, for example, um, because we, we would have to exclude half the managing directors of companies in that case, because Absolutely. they all show psychopathic traits. Well, one of the things that we discovered... <laughs> part of cheap business but if somebody is profiled as having a a history of fraud for example and you know that fraud is going to occur in your bank if you allow this person he's going to money launder he's going to use your bank to his 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 um his benefit and and in order to defraud other people then yes um i would most definitely exclude him from owning a bank account. I would not want that person associated in my organization. Alternatively, I can accept him, but monitor his transactions very carefully. That was exactly the approach that we adopted when we created risk values in 2001. Um, and the idea was that we would say, this is, an, this is a person that you should look at more closely or on a more regular basis, um, rather than to deny them services. Um, interestingly, a great deal of what you said your products are now doing is exactly what we designed risk values to do all those years ago. Um, and yet banks and indeed um, the, the technology companies that are providing services to banks flatly refused to use it because they said, if our customers find out that we are doing psychological profiling on them, then there's going to be uproar. And so after five years of trying to sell it and failing to get it even, even in testing in a single finance institution, we gave up with it. Um, and so now, 15 years on, it, it's, it's almost required, which is, which is quite fascinating. Can I go to the, um, the thing where we, you and I have a dispute um, over whether <laughs> it's dangerous? See, I'm, I'm very much um, of the opinion, as I have been since the 1990s, that crime doesn't change. Um, what changes the delivery mechanisms. So if we look at, for example, confidence tricks, it's gone from um, the idea of scratching a number on an accounting fraud confidence trick, scratching a number on a, on a piece of, uh, of clay to lie about the number of sheep that are going through a gate, all the way through many different forms of printing um, and ultimately putting information on a computer screen. It's all People are, are sucked in by the latest technology, but the crime doesn't doesn't change. The crime is still, I want you to believe this lie so that you act to your detriment. And however that's delivered, the fundamental remains the same, in my view. It does and it doesn't because you don't have to do anything to be hacked. You don't have to make any action to be hacked. All you have to do is not have sufficient cybersecurity. So you can end up today in a circumstance where I see it as fundamentally different is with the cyber component. Yes, there's still, a, as I said, there's still all the fundamental aspects that apply, but the actual mechanisms that are used to affect crimes and the increase in the vulnerability of people that are uninformed um, and that's 90% of people are uninformed. Um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to take any action. You don't have to do anything wrong. You can be randomly selected or just your name pulled off a database and well, attacked for true, no they, reason whatsoever. This is no different to when you're sitting at home watching TV and somebody knocks on your door and says, I've noticed you've got a hole in the roof. Um, and uh, I could fix it for you. It's it's still the same random selection. Uh -uh, it well, isn't because you would have to open the door, interact, and allow him in. Here you don't have to. Well, Here you have there, there's no interaction whatsoever. You're randomly selected by someone you've never met in your life, who has randomly done something or found something. Um, and and it decided to exploit it. There's so, no so action required by the person other than buying a smartphone or a computer.
It's burglary. Nothing. Then, isn't it? still, still fundamentally, it's burglary. But I have to say, and it isn't, way, back it isn't. The, way back in the 1990s, when I declared there is no such thing as cybercrime, which I still, which I still say, um, I did say if there is a cybercrime, if there is a cybercrime, then the only cybercrime is hacking, because there is a yes. difference between yes. that. I would, um, I would, I would agree with that because the scams you have to do something, you have to be taken in. So the basics of fraud would be proponents of that. The methodologies have definitely changed, but as far as but, hacking but then also, goes, if we, nothing. if we look at the the idea that effectively um, breaking into your computer is 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 using an electronic jemmy. Um, it's it's just basically someone who's using a crowbar to break open a window to get in to steal the clock off your mantelpiece or whatever. Um, the from the from from the point of view of the actual global conduct, it remains the same. But I also back in the 1990s highlighted the or not highlighted drew attention to the fact that people commit crime because they need something. A proper need, actual need, because they want something, um, or because they just do it because they can. There's an opportunity. Yeah, um, and it's it's to me fascinating that we're now what best part of thirty years after I was writing that, and this is still the analysis um, to say that the need or greed or just the hell of it, um, which is um, a uh, it, it's again comes back in my in my mind to say we are busy telling people to pay attention to the exciting stuff but we're not teaching them the real fundamentals of what criminals do because most crime can be identified by pattern, pattern analysis by the absolutely victim. and so we're doing, we're doing a, we're doing a disservice to the world at large all the old people all the young people um and people like me and you, who get caught by fraudsters because we're not paying attention, not because they're doing anything particularly clever, um, but it's true that the technology makes it easier, it makes it a lot easier. The um, anonymity that, um, that, that again, has been present since the 1990s, that anonymity has not improved, and it can be improved. The, 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 there are ways within the internet that, that can make anonymity much more difficult. But it's not oh, yes. in the interests of, of governments and it's not in the interests of, of the big companies to do it. Um, and so we see campaigners saying, you we should be doing this, we should be doing that. But nobody ever does anything about it. Why well, do you, think you see, this is, this, uh, I have a, my own, uh, please don't slaughter me for this because I have my own feeling about that, especially when it comes to South Africa. I don't believe there's any political will to combat crime. Then the other problem is, is that crime has created an industry. So if, the, if you combat crime effectively and you actually build your police force up to combat crime effectively in South Africa, you will no longer have a need for all these security companies and private security guards. You could halve them. Security guards, if you combat crime in South Africa, you lose millions of jobs, millions, because crime drives the South African economy. At every level, from the from from mining, from the top to the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, but but I don't think that South Africa is unusual in that. I mean, I think that we can look at um, at many countries around the world. I mean, I, I've just been looking at. Um, an absolutely shocking case in the States where um, 20 something children of age 13 have been found using very dangerous machinery in slaughterhouses. Um, and now you would think that this is illegal, but actually it's not. Well, using the dangerous machinery is described as illegal, but it's only dealt with by civil cases. So it appears to be unlawful rather than illegal. And secondly, um, the employment of these children is not unlawful or illegal. It's only because they were using the dangerous machinery. And I, I find it unfathomable that in a country where they are saying, hey, China, you can't put people to work in factories 
because it's because that's inappropriate that they've got their own children working in these fa in, in similar factories or indeed in conditions that are, are potentially even worse and even more dangerous um i don't think that we can identify south africa specifically as being effectively a, a nation of criminals because i think that the leader of the free world is every bit as bad and so is everywhere else um <laughs> This is exactly the, the the conversation I have. Everybody says to me, well, why don't you immigrate? And I'm going, like, to where? <laughs> where do you go? <laughs> At least we have good weather here. We have criminality. We have good weather. And you know what? Fundamentally, I think most South Africans understand the project, you know, the, the, the circumstances we live in, and we can defend against it. So in South Africa, your defense is to become independent your, for your existence to become independent of the government. So you need to have solar, you need to have a water filtration system, and you need to be able to have enough high walls and security deterrence not to need to go to the police. So you know what? We have to stay and fight for our country. Our country is worth fighting for, I believe. We need to strengthen all our systems and we need to raise awareness. Um, well, and we need to profile. As I said in my introduction, one of the things that I've noticed when I've been in South Africa is that the the problems that people talk about, the the petty violent the petty interracial violence in particular, that seems to be on a case by case basis. It doesn't seem to be institutionalized. Um, I mean I, I I've done things which people say they would not dare do and i'm i i was um uh at a, at a meeting organized by one of the, the large accountancy firms in johannesburg and i'd got on a train from pretoria um and i got off the train and i'd got in a minibus to get to my hotel and <clears throat> there was a, a a an accountant who happened to be black um who said i would not dare do that I said, well, you're part of the problem then, aren't you? I got on I got on the train and they were pleased to see me. When I got on the bus, they were pleased to see me. This is not it's what you're not, telling me the country is like. I don't see the problem as being on the ground. In When everyday people in South Africa have everyday conversations, with, be they black, white, Indian, purple, green, I don't really care. I see people as people. I've always done that my entire life. I've never considered myself well i am white i suppose i can't get away from that um i don't identify as anything else either <laughs> so, um, you know i i am what i am but i don't see the problem on the ground wherever i go people ask me for help i interact with all races all people all classes all social economic um classes um all education levels and I have never seen a person say to me, I won't use you because you're what? Or I have never seen a person just say, well, I won't interact with this person because they're black. This is not a person to person. This is a politically motivated, concerted effort to split people through race and cause um, these these rifts because they can be exploited politically and economically. The problem is, is when you make crime viable and profitable, you will have crime. And when you support the criminal elite, no matter from what country they are, you will have a growth in criminal behavior. I, I agree, absolutely. So if we're now looking to say that we want to be able to identify types of people rather than individuals perhaps um, who are likely to be committing a certain type of crime are we simply going to say well the politician left with a criminal isn't that too broad a brush to 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 apply well show me okay maybe not a criminal but show me one that isn't at least a liar because you know well, i can't possible. find one yeah, yeah. yeah you know it's 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 kind of and from there, where does it go? So you're dealing with a morally defunct person just from the lying perspective. <laughs> um, you, you said about psychological profiling being using the traits to predict behavior. Um, 
So how does that fit in with predictive policing? Well, predictive policing is again, as you say, for me, it's, it's, it's pattern analysis. For me, predictive policing is pattern analysis. If you have strong, it's not psychological profiling, it's, it's, it's criminological profiling through pattern analysis, and that will give you predictability. Um, so it's who's there, who, if there's a, a need and there's an opportunity and there's a vulnerability, that is your perfect storm. Um, and until we start using proper pattern analysis and now please don't do this um there's there's predictive policing is impossible um on fun. offender profiling a serial murderer for example well there's predictive a serial killer can't change he's driven by his needs and his needs are his needs and even when he's 70 years old he will still be driven by those needs and he will just change his victim demographic possibly if that's not the signature um so he will target weaker victims less able to defend themselves and we see that with 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 uh, financial profiling as well if you we are seeing pensioners targeted why pensioners because pensioners are the most computer illiterate people in the com in the in the country they still believe your word is your honor there's no such thing as honor in cybercrime there's no such thing as 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 you know as as reality almost uh, they don't understand the environment and this makes them a target and we see this not only in the us but in south africa we see pensioners using their entire losing their entire life savings to these people we see them scammed and then when you tell them they've been scammed they'll still borrow a fr from a friend to try to fix the scam i see it in my 90 year old uncle he's scammed every six months at least there's some i mean the other day somebody was selling a car online so he bought it and then they needed the tax and then it was the next thing so it's essentially fraud but it's it's targeted at pensioners and especially crypto they don't understand crypto so they can't go and invest in crypto by simply going and getting a binance account or a coinbase account and learning the basics because they don't understand the basics so they then a target for an investor to then say to them, well, give me your money. I'll invest it in crypto, never to be seen again. So these are the types of, you know, it's 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 profiling of the actual situation. And that's how we have to uh, to close down crime. Behavioral analysis, situational analysis. The example of just crypto. Profiling. The example you've just given of crypto, that's just Bernie Madoff. It's, it's, yeah, okay, so they're calling it crypto, it but, it, but it could just be, this is a, this is a, 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 an asset class that I'm specializing in. You don't need to understand that asset class. Just give me your money. Exactly. And the problem is also laziness. You know, when some, and, and it's, it's not just laziness, it's laziness and being overwhelmed. I think what I see with with people of my mom's age who I had to shout at in the middle of the, she doesn't realize that a computer speaker can pick up her talking in a bedroom, for example. She just doesn't get it. Um, <laughs> so you know that they, they don't understand. Why should you have to worry about that? <laughs> the, the the tech. Um, they don't understand the tech, and it's overwhelming because there's information coming at us in modern society from everywhere. Three quarters of it is either disinformation or misinformation. I don't believe at all in this term malinformation, which I think is the biggest joke in history. But in, 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 let me not even go on there. How can you tell the truth and that be done to spread malice? I'm sorry, the truth is the truth. And it's not your truth or my truth or anything else. There is the truth. That is the only truth. The truth um all of the social skewing of great, the truth there's a great deal in common with, a great deal in common with what you've said at various points in this with um my work in understanding suspicion and one of the things that um i was 
quite gratifying to hear you say is that we cannot avoid using racial, or actually I would go beyond that and say religious uh, and other profiling, um, because it is an essential part of somebody's makeup. And one of the things that we know is that people will inherently trust people like them. So we see intra-community crime, be it on a national basis or be it uh, on, on a religious basis, you know, that, that must be a good person because he goes to the same church as me. Um, and that is something that we really have to be able to get over so that we can say there, there are no no-go areas. We have to be able to look at every aspect of somebody's life if we're going to be able to understand them. And we need to understand them, otherwise we can't risk manage them. But it has to be done objectively. And I think this is the problem when you enter the field. I mean, I'm a person, I, I love to hear other people's viewpoints. So I'm completely open. I have my very solid opinions, which are difficult to change, but they're not impossible to change. So, I mean, this is, the, the, this is, this is a, such a fundamental thing is objectivity, the openness to consider something else. Now, when you just gave the example on the church, it, when we deal with human trafficking cases or predatorial type offenses where children are targeted, the church, funnily enough, and schools are one of the first places that we look because predators go where the prey is found, the prey of choice. So we've had a number of cases in South Africa, for example, where we've had youth pastors involved in predatorial behavior. And that is something that you're going to have to consider again with profiling. So you need to look at type of crime versus, versus geographics or location. Let's not say geographics because there's also internet. So a person that's looking for opportunity to exploit financial uh, institutions is going to go and work in a financial institution. He's got the keys, but <laughs> you've given him the keys if you haven't done the proper profiling and the background checks and everything else. So you need to really, really take your crime, look at where's your victim pool situated. I mean, if I was predatorial, for example, I would go and visit all the old age homes. And I would offer fantastic investment opportunities online to all the we'll, pensioners who have we'll no write clue. It. We'll write <laughs> it. You know, I mean, so you've got to look at victim pool versus location versus opportunity again. And that's why I say the situational analysis profiling for me is what will stop crime. You've got to look at circumstances at victim at offender at need at greed you know it all of these things play roles um no criminal commits crime with the objective of ending up in prison i have an overriding feeling of paranoia is that fair are we all being driven me? to points? are we no not you me are we all being driven <laughs> to the point where we are we are now so scared of what might happen that we that we end up effectively deers in the headlights. I think that paranoia is setting in uh, globally. I don't think this is just a South African problem. I think it's globally, and I think it's due to the fact that nobody knows what to believe. So you, as I said, um, information is so complex, and People are afraid. I mean, mo you know, you've got the you've got two types of people. You've got the stick your head in the sand ostrich type person who just really doesn't care, doesn't know, and just rolls along and isn't paranoid and doesn't read anything and doesn't watch the news or doesn't do anything. And then you've got the people that are actually taking cognizance of the globalization and the WHO and the moves to to take over state control of health and various things. And, and that these people are growing. If you look at the number of subscriptions to social media, alternate 
independent journalist uh, websites um, and, and, and blogs and, and podcasts, you will see that there is a remarkable shift in people that don't trust the le legacy media at all. All information is sought from alter alternate um, sources now. So the legacy media, the public has lost all trust. So how do you even get a message to people to alleviate their, their, um, their concerns? You can't because nobody trusts anybody anymore. And in well, South Africa, you shouldn't trust anybody. Well, sadly, we see that not just in South Africa, but, but all over the place, don't we? It's some um, Well, let's say pleasure. the trust should never exclude the control. So you can trust. Just make sure you've got control. <laughs> Laurie Peters-James, it's been an absolute pleasure and a great discussion in addition to a fascinating presentation. Right, so, so yeah, one of the things with when it comes to KOC is, is you know, when I, I would say let's just look at the origin of it and, and very briefly I would say um, when it comes to proof of address, um, a lot of what we see today, you, a lot of people, what I see is they don't ask themselves, why do we collect proof of address? Like there was an, a case, I think in 2015, with an Arab bank, um, where there was, uh, they were, I think they were the, the, um, assisting with, with terrorist financing for Hamas. Um, and what had ended up happening, and I speak under correction, of course, uh, I'm not too acquainted with the details of that. But what had happened is, is that when people went in to question the employees of the bank, they said, oh, we thought proof of address was something that was passed by uh, our local regu regulatory authorities. And the honest truth was, no, it was never something that was passed on in legislation or regulations or anything like that. And so a lot of people don't ask, well, what is the reason for us collecting proof of address? And when we look at it, I think I think a lot of it started with the Bank Secrecy Act in the U.S. Um, and the Americans sort of saying, listen, this is one of the best ways, or one way at least, I wouldn't say the best, but one of the ways that we can bolster our measures against anti-money laundering. And being the financial powerhouse, they, they permeated throughout the globe by, you know, them threatening to sever ties with, with banks if they don't incorporate the same sort of measures. Um, and as a consequence, we're all collecting proof of address, you know, in, in today's time as one of those those factors that we take into account along with identification, IP addresses, VPNs, um, source of funds, source of wealth, if it gets to a high risk sort of situation. And we also, but we need to ask ourselves, like, what is the value that we're getting from asking for proof of address? Is it is it really adding value to the KYC process? Are we really establishing you know, the, the, a proper risk assessment based on that. And to some extent, yes, it does show me where somebody at the end of the day sleeps. That's really what it's about. Where does someone sleep or supposed to sleep? Um, and maybe back in the day that used to work, but the world has turned into, um, it's become globalized. So everyone is traveling, everyone, their secondary citizenships. There's, it's, it's become more integrated rather than segregated. And so I think this poses big problems for, for proof of address in, at the end of the day. Um, does proof of address assist me with establishing where somebody is supposed to sleep and if it's a high risk country, if that country is sanctioned, you know, that sort of things, 100% yes, it does. Um, and we can check that with IP address. We can sort of establish where this person is at. And if, they, if the IP address, for instance, uh, provided there's no VPN, if the IP address and the proof of address it's very different. We can see, we can start asking questions like, okay, why is this happening? Why is that? We can establish this. Do we need flight tickets? Do we need proof of you staying in a hotel? You're just going on holiday. Um, I, is this for work that you travel constantly for work? What is the situation? But I think there's a lot of loopholes when it comes to proof of address as well. But there's also a lot of challenges that we need to take into consideration. Um, for instance, when it comes to refugees, asylum seekers, um, I would say even people that stay in tribal villages uh, in Africa, um, a lot of the the, the uh, tribes in in Australia, in, in America, there's a, there's challenges when it comes to proof of address and giving that documentation at the end of the day. Um, we can also look at at things like religion, 
where a woman is not really entitled to have a bank account, a residential address, or anything of her name. It has to be registered either in her father's name or in her husband's name. And it it, it makes that it, there are ways to, we can obviously verify that she is, you know, married and all of that. We can take those, those extra steps. At the end of the day, she can easily be used as a conduit for money laundering. And then I would say one of the, the other things to think about or categories of people that could find this as a challenge is um, with all the, the human trafficking scams that are going on, people would apply and the second that they step onto foreign ground, that the documentation gets confiscated and they get thrown into a brothel. If, you know, as one example. And if you manage to escape that and you go to the police, you report it, then you're still without documentation. So there's a whole process that needs to happen. And a lot of charities have sprung up um, and said, well, okay, listen, we can support victims like that. We can support refugees. We'll assist people with KYC processes and documentations and all of all, all of these things. Like that's re there's really been developments. Um, and the banks have also, at some of the banks at the very least, have in some, in, in a certain way, moved towards assisting, understanding and, Instead of de-risking, which has happened quite a lot, I know Barclays closed down, uh, what, in 2013, 250 accounts, was it Somalia or, I think it was Somalia, I'm not sure, I speak under correction, but there are a lot of bank accounts were closed for, for remittance uh, service providers, and that, in some in some cases, for some countries, that is the key source of income for people, a lot of, when the majority of the population is dependent on that, you really, banks really make it difficult, so banks de-risked quite a bit. But I see, also see the other side of that coin where a lot of banks have gotten onto the bandwagon of, well, let's assist them. So I know some of the banks in the UK, for instance, would have a no fixed address bank account, very limited financial product. Um, there will be cash thresholds, thresholds, all of that sort of thing going around that. But it's, it allows people that, listen, I only have identification. I was probably displaced because of a war. I'm coming into this country. I need access to these services because I, we, we all know without access to the financial system in some way, we cannot get, we cannot rent, we cannot um, uh, uh, take out loans, we we cannot, and obviously without without being able to pay for rent or getting some accommodation, you don't have proof of address. Um, if you're in a new country, you most probably need to get onto that mobile network, which if you, I know in South Africa, for instance, if you have to take out a new SIM card, this KYC process all over again makes it quite difficult. Um, there's, and, and, and even if you manage to get a job in that foreign country, first of all, you're going to have to go through the employee screening, which is KYC. And then on top of that, you're going to need that bank account for the money to be paid into. So there's a lot of challenges and difficulties that these people, these categories of people face. And I think there could be even more categories than what I've just mentioned. Uh, but just sort of in a nutshell, this is this is what those people are, are are facing on on a daily, well, not a daily basis, but when this does happen, when a war happens, they get displaced or they're running over the border. I mean, imagine, for instance, if you're running away from a war that's just hit your little town, and you have given all your your ID documents and proof badges and all the documentation to a relative, and you say to them, "Listen, I'll meet you on the other side of the border. We'll we'll meet at this place." and they, for instance, get killed. Now you've lost all the documentation. All the documentation just got destroyed. Your house was blown up while you were at a mall and then suddenly you're running for, for your life with the, with the clothes on your back. So there's a lot, or, or it gets confiscated. You manage to escape some sort of camp and whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of sort of nuances that one has to deal with when it comes to this and, you know, do, do we have the documentation for it? Um, <clears throat> But I've seen in the UK, there's a lot of, of, of charities that have sort of come to life that assist people with these sort of things. One of the fascinating things that I found in the UK was what was called a digital address. So local councils would use property that's been been given to them in some way um, as, as, as a way for people to provide these people with, with a digital address. So it's not a place where they can stay. But they can go use that address to to provide us proof of address for 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 the bank to get access to financial service. Now I'm not quite acquainted as to how that process works. Um, I, I kind of sort of also wondered to myself, like, imagine sixty people are using that exact same address. Like, is this really helping with anti money laundering measures in the in the same breath? You know, which what proof of address was initially intended for? 
Um, so they, they they are facing a lot of difficulties on that end. I know a lot of banks have and charities are, are working together to sort of solve that problem and give assistance where possible. Um, I think there are still a lot of nuances. I think there's a lot of things that still need to happen. Um, but I don't think, I think from at least from 2016 up until now, things have changed quite a bit. Um, I know in 2016, there was a study that I read from, from 2016 um, where it was, it was when you look at the study, it was and they surveyed I think seven countries, uh, and I forget which countries those are now. Um, but from that study, it was there was a lot of issues that were identified. Like they did not know about what we have now with the charities and, and all these sort of things that are springing up. Um, and the study just really showed that all of it is difficult. Banks are closing down. They're de-risking. They're not even managing the risk. They're just de-risking completely. Um, bank accounts are being shut down. Um, this is affecting massive pop, like I said, Somalia. Um, and so they, they, that, that study really showed. So looking from 2016 up until where we are now, I've seen massive changes in that. So there has been improvements, but yes, there are still difficulties that these people face. And I think to, you know, to a big extent, the banks also need to ask, well, what is our policies and procedures? You know, are we really, are we de-risking? Are we managing the risk? Are we providing tiered financial services? Are we looking to financial inclusion? I know financial inclusion is 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 a is a struggle, um, and, and it, but it's also an opportunity. Like there was a, a case that I read about in, and I speak under correction, I think it was Kenya or Uganda. I'm not sure, but this it was a mining company. And the mining company went and sold it. And so they had a bunch of trucks available that they had to do something with. And somebody decided, listen, let me let me start a, a financial institution. That's essentially what they did. They turned the mining company around. They equipped the trucks with Wi-Fi. And they drove the trucks into all the, the parts of, of, of the country uh, to give people access to financial services. They provided them with financial advice, you know, sort of taught them, listen, this is the bank accounts. And they got a lot of people on board with it um, and it served their bottom line perfectly. So I think there's also that great, uh, case to be made that, you know, there's a bottom line that, that banks could make um, for financial inclusion. But yeah, there's a lot of risk because every every bank will fear a fine and reputational harm, I think far higher up on the hierarchy of risk than financial inclusion. Um, and this is just from, from what I've seen, but also policy and, 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 and governance aside, I think one of the things as well as training, just training personnel, your KYC personnel, and saying to them, well, listen, there's going to be a time when you deal with this nuanced matter. This is how you deal with it. This is what you should do. And I think there's not a lot of training because obviously those cases are, are few and far between. But when it does happen, when suddenly there's an influx of, of displaced individuals and they all now need services, I think it can be absolutely chaos. Um, and there's and there's also a lot to be said about about is is proof of address really doing or providing its worth in terms of anti-money laundering measures um i think we we also need to ask that sort of question like for instance the, when it comes to ongoing monitoring how uh, robust and and consistent is is that process and measure in the banks because if you're not doing ongoing monitoring i would say at least on an annual basis in the sense of just updating that proof of address there are quite a few ways around proof of address at the end of the day. I mean, and I'm not talking about forgery at this point. I'm talking about just something as simple as, well, consider you, you uh, I funneled a lot of money and I'm using those illicit proceeds to get a secondary citizenship by buying a property in Cyprus. Now I've got the residence. So obviously, I'm, I'm you know, sort of broadly brushing over the processes and, and procedures to get through uh, all of this and, you know, get your secondary citizenship. But in a nutshell, I would think that, okay, so I'm using this illicit proceeds to buy a property in Cyprus and doing so, I get the secondary citizenship. And Cyprus might be a much lower risk rating than, you know, a country that might be far higher up on, on the risk rating. So if I'm staying in a, in a high risk country, I would want to sort of whatever documentation I give to a bank to be in a low, medium risk country. That will really make it much easier for me so I come, don't come up as a red flag and there are ways to do that so then if i decide so if you're looking at an ip address i decide to go on holiday to to cyprus to do all of this 
open up the bank account via my, my computer or just do it in person while I'm there. Um, and then at, the, at that point, everything is pinging in Cyprus. I've got the 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 the, the home in, in Cyprus. I'm giving all those documents to the bank uh, as proof of 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 uh, KYC. And now I'm 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 pinging in for for that specific bank in Cyprus. I'm pinging as a very low risk, which is great. It serves me well. I can then, if if there's no ongoing monitoring in Cyprus on an annual basis, say, well, are you staying here? And also that, you know, how do you really prove that I'm not there? Um, if I then decide to open up a bank account in the Cayman Islands, well, the same thing you're doing going through KYC, I can give the documents from Cyprus. And so it's still low risk. And now I'm creating a, a channel of bank accounts and none of them are any wiser to say, well, this is what we're looking at. Um, this is this person is actually in a high sitting in a high risk country. So there are also ways around that. And we really need to question is is proof of address doing what it needs to do it needs to do. I know that FATF has now you know posted this this guidance on, on digital identification. Um, I think to some extent it might serve a purpose. I'm not sure how far it's going to go. I, I briefly just sort of scanned through the document. Um, maybe it can go to some extent to sort of you know pin ge uh, geographic uh, data on on a, on a particular customer, but it remains to be seen. And yeah, so that that's that's what I think. Uh, there's 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 a lot of challenges on the one end, uh, both uh, on both ends. One for for banks and people doing the KYC, but also for those that need to provide the documentation. In terms of it, has there been a lot of progress? Definitely. Um, are we have we fully solved the problem? I doubt it. I am fascinated by quite a number of things you've said. Um, I'll start with the photograph, which I can't show you because I don't know where it is, um, that I took in, it was, either, it was either South Africa or Ghana, of a man walking mm. past a wall full of P.O. boxes. Yes. And each of those P.O. boxes are addresses because yes. the people that have got those P.O. boxes, in many cases, don't have a house. They've got a shanty somewhere. Um, yeah. Or they've got some, and even if they've got a house, they probably don't have a front door. Um, I, I've, I've seen um, in the back streets of, um, well, not really back streets. I mean, they're, they're not slums in, in the sense that that people don't take care of them, and, but they are slums in the sense that they're, they're, they're just un, undeveloped shacks, basically. Um, mm. and people sometimes they don't have proper roofs, they don't have proper walls, they certainly don't have toilets. I've, I've seen a woman standing in the middle of the street just pulling her skirts up and peeing in the middle of the street. Um, this is the big challenge that I see across enormous parts of the of the world, where you know you you and I both sit in in nice developed cities, um, but you've only got to go um, what twenty kilometers, thirty kilometers in your case, and you're looking at large areas where there is where, where there aren't even roads, and in places like Accra, this has been the situation in the city centre. Um, you know, capital city, and it's still just got mud tracks in the middle of the city. So we're looking at this, that to, me, to most people who are working in financial institutions that are looking at KYC, and certainly those that are working in regulators and at the FATF, they have no concept of what this is like. They have no. never flown across Lagos and seen mile after mile after mile of they're not even shanties. They they are they're, and they're not even proper shacks. They're just a piece of a piece of timber leaning against the next piece of timber, right. and there's a family under each one. Um, so these challenges that have not been improved and cannot be improved um, within any reasonable time scale or within any reasonable budget. These are the challenges that um, those people that are saying you've got to identify addresses because that's the best way of knowing who somebody is. They simply mm. have no concept of that. And yes. yes, these people are using mobile phones, as you said earlier, um, as, a, as a as a method of identification, because somebody is saying, well, we're going to allow this. But if address is the primary way of knowing who you're dealing with, it simply doesn't work for hundreds okay. of millions of people across the world. Yes. And 
I, I look at that and then I compare that to your next example, or your next, uh, the later point, which is the Cyprus, Cayman Islands thing, where you've got wealthy people who go and create a, a an address and an identity within that address, and then they can use that to create another one, and they can bounce that, leverage that, which is something that we've seen for many years. It's not it's not yeah. something that's novel, yeah. but yeah. I think that the important thing here is that we're seeing that as as these countries are being pushed towards ever greater levels of credibility, and ever ever more greater of, of regulate levels of regulation, that the credibility of their schemes is now making what were dodgy areas more credible. So, you know, buying passports and the like, I don't have a particular problem with that um, as, a, as an issue, so long as you know who people are. What I do have a problem with is when people buy a passport and change their name. And we mm. saw that in the 1990s when an American bankrupt changed his name, became known as Van Brink, um, which was nothing to do with the Brinks van, incidentally, Van Brink, okay. and created a network of financial institutions in the Caribbean, starting with Grenada, um, and eventually ended up um, somewhere in southern, not South Africa, um, being shot to death in a compound where he had created yet another attempt. And in fact, he tried to buy the central bank of our country in, in Africa at one point. And all of that started because he was able to move, um, to, to, to change his identity um, in order to disguise his dodgy past. But you would look at that um, in, in jurisdictions now and say that jurisdiction has, is compliant with all of the things that the FATF say, so it must be okay. I've got this document from this man, it must be okay. And my mm. attitude is, well, it, if, the, if the jurisdiction is dodgy, I don't care if they're compliant with the FATF. Are we allowed to say that? <laughs> I, I I would agree. I would agree with you, Nigel. I think, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, like, like you said earlier, the, first of all, the FATF has no concept of this. And, and the question is, can we actually solve this? Uh, to give an example, um, I know a lot of, of foreigners that would come to South Africa are literally staying in rooms in, in some in house somewhere. And they're dependent on the landlord, so to speak, to sort of give them proof or letter to confirm well, this, this person does stay here, um, but it gets worse as you go out. I mean, in the informal settlements, there are no road names. There's no street names. So what, Shack 34 of we? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really give you that proper address. That's the problem. And I can, if, I can, if I can take that proof of address, lift it up and move it to, to you know, next to Shack 304, was that really uh, uh, the the right proof proof of address? Like, if I can move my home that quickly and easily, no. <laughs> assuming that the shacks even have numbers. Um, I mean, I, I have seen shacks that have curtains in front instead of front doors. Yes. I was. I gave directions to somebody in Ghana once in in Accra, um, and the directions were: you go down here until you come to the junction, and you turn left at the dead dog that's lying under a taxi. And it had been there for three days, and so the, the directions worked perfectly. There was a dead dog lying under under a taxi because the taxi had run the That's dog true. over, run into a lamppost, and the driver had run away and left the taxi. So it's unfortunate, think, but it's true. Yes. That's, the, that's the way that you have to give directions because there are no street signs. Yes, there's no road names, there's no street signs, there's no house numbers, there's nothing, and that wasn't even in a shanty. That was in a developed part of the town. Um, yes, it's it, the, the the these problems are are immense. Um, something else that you cropped that, that, you, that you a question that, that cropped up from something you said um, without referring back to what you said I'm going to ask a, a, a nice, a, an esoteric question are banks using de-risking de as an excuse to get rid of poorly performing accounts not the problem's not just um, not, not a, a, an account that's always in trouble but just one that doesn't have much money I mean you're, that's a contentious question um, I would I would say yeah, to some extent, I would say yes, but in the same breath, if 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 uh, depending on, I would say volume. If there's a lot of these accounts that's not serving them and it's costing them more in terms of compliance, personnel, administration, the IT infrastructure, all of that, to have those accounts, yeah, most probably because money money does talk at the end of the day. 
And if it doesn't serve the business, because that's what a bank is, the business, if it doesn't serve the company, it's costing them more. They most probably would de-risk just because it's not serving, it's not bringing in enough money. Um, I've seen a lot of these sort of mobile payment services cropping up. Um, but then again, they perform very well. But I think the figures for them are much different than what we're seeing for banks. So the the appetite for finances differs between these two. So I think it would be a lot less. I think there's a big bottom line to get from these accounts. They're bringing in money regardless. I know with, with foreigners um, just coming to work in South Africa, they're constantly transferring money back and forth. Like the, the way that money passes is incredible how many transactions happen in one particular day. Um, I would be fascinated to see the numbers for sure, to see, well, listen, just across the four top four banks in South Africa, what are we looking at? What are those numbers? Um, but I think what I've seen with with a lot of these, these mobile payments and, and remittance services, they're making coin. They are, they're making banks. Um, whether that's sufficient for the actual top four banks, I am not so sure. I don't have those numbers, but I would say, yes, that is such a possibility that they could de-risk because it's not serving the business. The compliance costs are far higher. And if you if the risk isn't managed in such a way so, just, so that we avoid the, the two biggest risks being a penalty and financial harm and the cost to do that, yep, they most probably would de-risk. Have I seen it? I know. I noted what you said about remittance services being debanked, and that's, I, I understand the risk behind that. Um, but you've also talked about large numbers of people coming over the border, essentially running away from trouble. But also, um, I, I think there's quite a lot of people move within South Africa because of because of tribal trouble or because um, of gang trouble. Um, and they likewise end up somewhere without any documents at all. Um, those are the people that I that I don't see as a banking risk, but I do see as a regulatory risk. Um, mm. But then we go beyond that to where they are a banking risk, where they are, um, how many of people fleeing um, terrorism are the terrorists? Um, how can we identify those? We have no data upon which to do that. So that's not a South African problem. Um, we have it 800 it's people terrible. a day, turning up, well, some days 800 people turning up on the, on the British coast. It is, in, it is inconceivable to me that there are no troublemakers amongst them. Yes. How do we, um, how do we do that when we have no documents? In many cases, the troublemakers have thrown their own documents over, overboard anyway. Um, they, 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 they choose not to have documents. It's not, they haven't lost them because their house has been burned down. Um, how much of a problem do you have with, um, with, with basically importing organized crime and trouble and gang activity from across borders? Uh, it's it's a massive risk in South Africa. Um, I don't know if you've if you've seen the documentary, for instance, just you know recently that was made by Al Jazeera on um, the gold mafia from Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's just one of the, the illicit tobacco trade is a massive problem in South Africa as well. Um, there's a lot of terrorist groups that come over, and and a lot of funds are traveling that we do not. But we're not able to track we're not able to monitor we, we only find out about it sometime down the line where that problem lies is it in terms of KYC personnel in terms of transaction monitoring where does that issue lie not sure maybe i i would say and, and I'm, I'm actually quite scared to make the statement but i would say to some extent that's still business and it's good business and if we can make it pass through a bank account for a while that's to make some coin the, the the financial penalties or the regulatory penalties will be you know it's like a, a day's worth of, of profit so it's, it's minute in terms of what we made i know that um, our revenue service is really the the watchdog that's hunting all of this down um and the, the penalties there are massive but also those penalties in in, in terms of what 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 has caused the deficit in taxes uh, for the fiscus is is the question of how does it get determined if we if you don't have a full picture of just how much illicit money went through the accounts um how are you able to track that but similarly we you know with terrorist groups like it it's an abundance it's an absolute abundance and there's no way to track it you just on on, on the kyc personnel side you get an application so 
presupposing, of course, that you're using a decent uh, uh, software to sort of run these checks. So you're sitting there, and what you get at the end of the day is an ID, a proof of address. Let's say that's all legitimate. And then you get um, uh, the screening that gets run uh, for adverse media, any sanctions, all of that. None of that pops up. What else are you, do, do you have to, to, your, to your availability to check whether this person is part of, of a terrorist group? They don't have formal registers that you know we've been able to hack and, and put onto a database and say, oh, these are all the individuals. There we go. Um, if if you have anyone that's sort of part of this, go for it. You know the whole structure of a terrorist group is to keep everything informal, off the record. Nothing is written. Um, you know it's very clandestine. So I would say there's there's just no way for us to really see it. Um, I can be part of six terrorist groups um, without any of the uh, the terrorist groups knowing about each other. That I'm part of, you know, so conflict of interest to a great extent, <laughs> but also the banks and anyone that does KYC for that matter, it's not going to know because there is nothing so, to do. It's, it's, I think it's important to, we, we've been talking about South Africa, but this is not a South African problem, is it? It's a, mm -hmm. it's not, it, I mean, it's, it's an Africa wide problem, but it's not only Africa. Um, yeah, it's not. Where there are large numbers of people who, um, you don't need a lot of people actually it doesn't need to be a lot of people to cause a lot of trouble um but the these people because they don't nobody has been able to identify them therefore there are no previous records so when they come to you and say we've come from lesotho or wherever there's no way of establishing that to be true no yes. way no way um and I, I don't know what the position is on south african identity cards does everybody have an identity card uh i would say most people do i think we've seen a lot of cases where it's it's been forged especially for foreigners coming into south africa that there's massive forgery that goes on um i would say most people have an identity card the, the majority at least from but also Nigel, i speak from a perspective of the the, the sort of circles that i walk in yes everyone has one um, am I aware of literally cases where people have zero identification? I don't know. I wonder sometimes how many of our births are not registered. Where we just have foreigners coming in, they have a baby on this side, and we cannot go to a hospital to register that birth. So it's home birth, cannot register it because we don't even have proper documentation to be here. So we risk being deported. So when you look at that concept, I think there's a lot of that. I think there's quite a bit of that, and that's why they'll stick to sort of informal jobs like working on a farm or just, you know, cleaning or that sort of thing, because it's very low risk. The, the chances of getting deported or reported to authorities are very small. Um, and this is sort of where a lot of these uh, remittance services come in and they can use that to to push the money through and, and, and all of that. Um, I think also to to a great extent, they'll use addresses from their home country to just say, well, we're visiting here, whatever the case would be. Are the banks doing ongoing monitoring? I mean, I've seen banks that, like, like for instance, my bank, 14 years, they've asked me only once to update my profile. So only once they asked me, well, where do you actually stay? In 14 years, I've moved quite a bit. So the question really does become, okay, and I can get the bank account, even if it's a low tier, uh, the lowest financial service account, that's fine. Um, but if that bank is not doing annually, annually doing ongoing monitoring to see what, uh, you know, sort of what's happening um, in terms of where you stay, I can get away with it. And so I, I think the, the possibility of, of a lot of people not having identity cards, I think it exists. Do I know about them? No, because obviously they, they're not part of that financial system. I haven't seen that. They don't really engage with that. They'll maybe use identity from another country or their origin country. But they won't have a passport they won't have anything and most probably they're getting a proof of address to say well i'm just staying in this sort of informal settlement in a room or whatever the case may be i'm on holiday and then once that that they, they stay in south africa is finished it's expired then they'll still just stay on and if a bank if i did all the kyc stuff to open that that low tier financial account with a bank um right at the beginning when everything was valid and the, the bank doesn't do ongoing monitoring I can stay here for a year. Maybe they'd say the, the stay was valid for six months. I can stay on for a year, two years, three years until eventually the authorities catch me. 
and I get deported and then yeah. But will the bank account be closed down after I get deported? I don't know. I I, I haven't seen a case like that. Um, probably not, because we know that um we know that, that corporate accounts um continue to exist for a number of years after companies have been struck off. Um yes. it's one of the things that I, I have always criticized my clients for um saying where there is somewhere within those documents a finite position why are you not recording that finite position so for example a work permit yeah. you know, if your work permit is expired we'll give you three months then we're closing your account yeah. unless you come back to us with a new work permit and that seems to me to be a perfectly ordinary sensible course of action to adopt because if the person doesn't have a work permit, they're not supposed to be in the country. If they're not supposed to be in the country, they're not supposed to have a bank account. In, in yes. most cases, that's an external account. Um, and in the case of companies, how is it that companies, that, that, that all of these monitoring systems that, come, that the banks pay a fortune for, don't register when a company gets struck off? Because uh, from, from, from what we can see in, 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 uh, in South Africa, for instance, is that you, you, there's not I, I, at least I don't know, but I haven't seen it. But they does they don't publish the register of all uh, the companies struck off in one particular year. So I would say if they publish the register that say, well, for 2024, these are the companies that have struggled, or at least every quarter, whatever the case may be. And there's a quick search database that I can access to say, this is the country, uh, uh, this is the company, this is what I'm looking for. Is this company struggled? But the problem is at this point, as far as I understand the system, at the very least. I have to go individually search every company. So it's not like an Excel spreadsheet where I can quickly run it against. It's not something that can get registered onto software that can also run a company hit registry. What we've seen overseas is that is often the case. So we work with software. We, we, when it comes to companies, we get registry hit. So it'll tell us, listen, it's registered there. This is the address. Has it been deregistered? Is it still active or is it not? So there is software out there that can actually do that. And when you know something gets deactivated, we'll get a notification from the system because the system will update it and say, oh, you need to do ongoing monitoring. You need to do a reassessment to review um, to see where this is at. In South Africa, I have not yet seen that. Um, I don't know how much the software in South Africa integrates with uh, Companies and Intellectual Properties Commission and their registers on, on, on deregistered companies or deactive companies. So the, the problem, again, comes down to governments failing to um, provide the, the necessary data within an accessible and easily accessible and affordable format. Yes, That's because it's not that difficult to extract it. Yeah. Yeah. Total change of subject. What mm. happens to a tribal woman's name on marriage? <laughs> um, I am not. I'm not familiar with that. I know that there's. So it's a. So we've got customary uh, customary law. And then we've got, you know, the civil law. So there's there's two sides of it. And I've never really sort of ventured into customary law. But um that name, I I would I would I would think to myself that it takes on still the name of the husband. I still think it does. The the surname would change to that of the husband. When we look but, at when we look at Chinese communities, the Chinese women historically, although it is it has changed quite a lot in recent years, um, would actually keep their their maiden name. And they would become madam that name. Um, mm. In Indonesia, um, there are quite a lot of women who use only one name. Um, uh, so mm. it makes no difference if they get married or not. There's, there's, there's no, there's no change. They are just one name. Um, I don't, I don't think these days. I don't think very much turns on whether a woman is married, um, except that it does help understand the money flows within the account. Um, but I mean, 1970s. I was clearing out my parents' house um, a couple of years ago, and I found documents in the 1970s. My mother had to get my father to countersign to rent a television. <laughs> what? <laughs> she had a better job than my father. She earned more than my father. She was she had a, a demonstrable profession, whereas my yeah. father um, had loads of qualifications, but it wasn't recognized as a profession. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But she had to get him to have sign so the family could rent a television. I think, oh, come on. So so she had to countersign just be before she could even get the TV. Like they would not approve it until there was a counter signature, right? My father, my father had to go into the shop 
and sign that it was okay for my mother to rent a television. <laughs> the times have changed. <laughs> I mean, well, nowadays. But I think that when we look at this and we say, you know, that, that where the world is today, we forget that large chunks of the world are still where we were 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, and we cannot apply the FATF's, primarily the Americans' idea that the world all operates in one way. Going yeah. back to the problem of dresses, um, the world doesn't all operate in one way. I mean, you said that um, earlier that, that there are various things that women can't do in, um, without their husband say so, like open a bank account without husband or father approves it. And mm -hmm. these are things that the people who make the, 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 the global policies um, do not understand and do not pay attention to. And when somebody from South Africa stands in an FATF meeting and says, you do not understand, it is not possible to do what you are saying, they just say, yeah, of course it is, no problem. And then they put mm. you on a blacklist, um, mm. or grey list, yeah. whichever one it is these days. Um, yeah, and list. So you, when, when we look at, at, I think people tend to look at Johannesburg, they look at Sandton and think, okay, South, Af South Africa is developed. Or they look at the, the houses around the ports and, um, um, and at Table Mountain and say, oh, this is really nice. They don't look out at what's happening in the rest of the country where the, where the problems are caused in many ways by these issues. Um, I know that there was a, a bank in the back of a van um, in Actually, that was gone as well, um, where it worked because they had um, line of sight radio that they were able to send, which was quite impressive. Um, so they could link from one village to another with a van going from village to very expensive and complicated process, but they made it work. Um, and they were the first country to use e-money um, with a, um, with, with a, a, a local, uh, local version of Mondex. Mm -hmm. um which was the first which was the first e-wallet basically um and this is 1990 something uh, mid 90s well mondex started in the in, in the early 1990s um but it was in ghana in 1997 98 something like that um and so the technology has been in use around um around the region and yet it's not taken off um, so Mon the, 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 the equivalent of Mondex, e Ecobank's equivalent of Mondex did not take off um, because people couldn't use it unless there was a, 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 a day-to-day use. What are we seeing with the idea that we're supposed to push the world onto e-wallets um, once you're outside the urban environments? Is, there, is, there, um, is that viable or, or did they even use cash as we know cash or were they still using local tokens? So South Africa specific, you think? Yeah. Um, I think so. A lot. I think just a lot of it is moving in in, in cash. I think there's there's still this massive uh, dependency on actual cash. Um, I see, but in South Africa, I see a lot of e-wallets happen, especially with the farmers. It's it's e-wallets is the is the go-to thing, um, but then eventually, some way, they're withdrawing cash. So there's there's a need for the 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 um, technology is needed for transfers. That's really where it starts. Everything else is not necessary because if if they can stay under the radar and not cause to leave too much of a digital footprint, it it, it in a way serves them. Um, but to be honest with you, I haven't seen more information or data on on this particular thing where has the movement to e-wallets and, and these sort of electronics that have been in play for a while now, why is it not cashed on to a greater extent where we, we're virtually just, you know, cashless? We're not we're not taking notes anymore. Um, like China, for instance, you know, we, you know, we spoke about where we said, well, listen, it's, we think everything is going digital. We didn't know we could bring money. Um, so I haven't really seen the numbers and what the case that he says and, you know, what we're looking at. Um, but I know for a fact that when it comes to these remittance services or all of that, where it's mental for everyone is the transfer over back. So getting money in South Africa and transferring that back to uh, the accounts back in their uh, origin country. 
Um, so I, I would say to some extent, um, if, if, if the technology facilitates the transfer from a South African bank account into whatever bank account they have, and then that can be transferred into another account uh, with a bank that sits in their origin country, that's all they need. All the other financial services is, is, is forced by the wayside because there's no need for it. Um, but and that, that, just, that, problem, that problem's been solved for decades by Mexican yes. workers in, in the USA, where, the, yeah. um, uh, where the, 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 the worker opens a local bank account and gives the card to his family at home. They just take money out of an ATM in, in a Mexican village. Um, mm. So the problem of, of exporting those monies without having to go to a remittance agent um, was solved long ago. Um, the question then is whether or not the, say for example the the worker is in South Africa whether that whether the South African bank says why are all the withdrawals on this account in Lesotho mm. um, and um, and says that's not what we want therefore we're not therefore we're going to close the account um, yes. is that I, I would I would look at that and say the amounts of money that are involved here are fine for a family living there um, and the amount that's going into the account in the first place is is, is consistent with what the guy is earning therefore it's not unreasonable for that to happen mm. um, but i'm not sure that that people who take a people who take a view of risk without understanding risk i'm not sure they would they would make the same distinction i'm also not so sure and again it comes back to well what are the policies that are being communicated from the top down as we as we said earlier, are they de-risking because it's not financially viable as a as a in, in business sense? It doesn't make business sense for the for the bank. Is that one of the discussions that's being held at the top and saying, well, let's rather instead of incorporating and training our personnel in terms of looking at risk for those accounts in a particular way, let's just do away with it altogether. So I think that does exist. Again, even if the if de-risking is, is is not the 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 the, the objective of the board. What ends up happening is, is that is the the proper risk and training being communicated from the top down? Like I said earlier, you know, when we look at the the Arab Bank situation in I think 2015, um, a lot of the personnel did not know why they're asking for a particular document. They just know that they need to ask for it. They don't know where it comes from. They don't know why. So that that why so the like the five uh, W's, you know, what, where, why. That sort of the, it, those. If you don't, if people are not asking those questions, you don't have somebody with the sort of mindset of I need to look at this from every angle. I need to sort of think out the, outside the box and just apply common common sense in terms of understanding. Like you said, there's going to be withdrawals from this account in the Sutu. That, that it's reasonable. That, that it makes sense within the uh, holistic profile of this customer. Yes, that's not a, that's not a risk. We can we can let that go. I don't know if the training is happening in in at, at the the lower levels at at the KYC I level. Tell you with, I can tell you with absolute certainty it is not, um, because what we're, what we're seeing across the world is that training is based on the shortest possible time, at the lowest possible cost, mm -hmm. um, and it's focused on compliance. It is the the. Do you remember right at the beginning of all of this, people were talking about you've got to train on compliance, you've got to train on awareness. There is mm. no awareness training. The vast majority of organizations or no significant awareness training. Mm. Um, and the idea that people can be empowered to identify suspicion is completely alien across the entire financial sector, across the entire world, because everyone is everything is now compliance-led because the risk is not of being found to be money laundering, of being prosecuted for that. The risk is of, of the regulator coming in and saying you didn't tick that box you should have done here's a hundred thousand dollar fine yes and that leads to the training becoming a tick box exercise as well it's Absolutely. like just it's like so so uh, 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 i spoke to to uh, a woman in in uh, in the space as well and she's one of the top voices uh she she said to me and it's the same thing that we, we're speaking about the same issue we're highlighting the same problems which is when you take a piece of legislation, you need to comply, you need to say, well, this is my compliance register for, for that piece of legislation. It just becomes, well, this is what, this is section so-and-so says this. Do I comply with it? Yes. And that, and it's just that. That's all that it is. But, and then, and then, then do it for all, for all the legislation, for each piece of legislation, they'll just pull this checklist together. And it's like, we need to move away from it being a checklist, an obligation register, so to speak. But I think that's, I think that's increasingly difficult because, 
you and I look predominantly at financial crime regulation and financial crime compliance. So I don't I look at risk, but, but you know, from um, but it's it's that area. But if you look at the compliance in the broader sense, there are now so many compliance areas that if you're going to it's micromanaging the business by regulation by external regulators um everything from health and safety at work all the way out to policies on esg um and on um, every other thing you can imagine saying we must say this we must do it in this way um we must not say this we must not do it in this way that in order to undertake any form of business that the regulatory regime is now so widespread and so complex that it's impossible not to follow the tick box exercise because otherwise you'd be doing nothing but compliance. And tick um, box, the tick box approach plays into the um, in, into the the agenda of let's move as much as possible to technology because the tick box is is binary: do we or do we not? Yes. And technology can do that. So technology, from my point of view, is actually serving a purpose in that it's taking away the unskilled question of those tick boxes. Yes. Um, and so we should be. What we should be seeing is is compliance people moving from compliance, which is mechanical, to risk, That's which good. is not mechanical. Yes. Risk is in, risk is an intellectual exercise. Um, it, you, you, you have to understand what you're doing. You have to think fast. You have to, you know, this, risk people are clever. Compliance yep. people, frankly, don't need to be very clever. They don't have to be clever. Um, yep. so, no, so the, the, the real question is, why are we seeing so much additional compliance measures which are difficult to comply with and requ requiring um, frontline staff, amongst others, to comply with what are genuinely, in most cases, tick box exercises. You know, we've gone through the position of saying we don't want tick box exercises, to saying, well, actually, tick box exercises are all we've got. Mm -hmm. And so I see a problem in the the fact that we have de-skilled the people in the compliance department to the extent that they cannot do the primary objective, which is detect and deter and report money laundering. Do you think that is partly due because we are separating these two professions, compliance and risk, rather than integrating them? I mean, if you look at uh, the, the, the risk registers and compliance, just if we speak about controls, for instance, so you've got the, the risk department would have its uh, control registry or repository, and the compliance would have its own one. And sometimes a lot of these, a lot of the times, in fact, all the times that I've seen, the controls are more or less the same stuff. But now they're sitting with duplication all of, and it's in segregate. So you and these two uh, sort of departments are not speaking to one another at all. So we have the compliance provision, just thinking in terms of check boxes. So yeah, I've, I've complied with this, complied with that, I've complied with this. This one's not complied with. The controls are very much. I mean, I've seen I've seen some horrific stories about controls uh, where where I'm, I'm sometimes questioning myself. I'm like, do, do you understand? And I've also seen the same in risk as well. Where, where, you know, you'll have a, a the main risk is, is let's say, for instance, load shedding um, in, in, in South Africa. And you'll have that main risk being duplicated quite a few times. But the, the description or the consequence that follow is, is something different. And I'm like, no, no, no you, you, you're duplicating this. You need to understand <clears throat> uh, yeah, subcategory risks that follow from a main risk. So th there's, there's issues in that as well. But now, most of the times, none of these two departments are speaking to one another. You're sitting with two registers. There's not a holistic view. That's really weird, what it comes down to. And if these, if the compliance officer were said, okay, cool, you need to look at it together with the risk department, I think then we're going to start moving away from this tick box exercise. Because if you just compliance, for the most part, is do I comply, do I not comply? As you said, very binary. But also when you start looking at controls and you're looking at, at it from a risk perspective, because you, you can say, yes, I comply, I don't comply. But when you start looking at the regulatory risks, um, the financial the financial harm, reputational harm, that's when it starts bordering over to risk. So it moves away from the tick box exercise and compliance. And, you, and for the most part, what I've seen, when it comes to speaking to compliance departments, that overarch to, to risk 
does not happen. They look at it simply as right. this is my checklist for an act, and this is the penalty in terms of that act if I don't comply with section X, Y, and Z. And if I comply with section, if I don't comply with section A, B, C, there's another penalty for that. And that's where it stops. And most of the times I would end up asking them, well, did you ever consider if any of these things happen and it goes to the media, which it will, um, what is the reputational harm? No, we, we didn't consider that. It was usually the response that I gave. Then I'm like, okay, does your risk department consider this? No, because risk department doesn't look at compliance. So there's there's no communication between the two. It's not an holistic approach. It's segregated, and everyone's just doing their small portion um, of work that they need to do. And often what I've seen with registers, whether it's control repositories or risk registers, compliance registers, all of this, it's just how can we inflate these registers so that we're sitting, for instance, with control repositories where we sit with 23,000 controls because that makes me look good to the board. And I'm like, no, less is more. If you use common sense, less is more when it comes to this because you're never in a million years going to be able to have an holistic monitoring approach and view of 23,000 controls. You're increasing your cost for personnel. You're increasing, you're never, you're monitoring every, every few thousand controls every year. So if, you can, if you're able to do a full review and audit of your controls, for instance, just taking controls as an example, within one year, you've essentially achieved quite a bit. You've achieved, achieved a miracle. Uh, but now what happens is to be keep inflating and adding and duplicating. So it just increases the cost. And when it comes to audits, nobody's going to be able to get a holistic approach of it. And now you, you're auditing this small portion of, of controls. And when you do the next bit, there might be duplications. Now, I don't know whether how this links in to an audit report three years ago where it's like, oh, actually, this report now speaks to something that I did three years ago in this company, where that not this control doesn't work with that control, doesn't speak to one. So that's so it's just, it's it's all just lost. It gets lost in translation. It's increasing of costs. And I think that's really why, you know, when it comes to compliance and speaking about tick box exercise and all of that, I think it's not an holistic approach that people are taking. They're happy to just go with, let's tick it. Whose idea is it to have 23,000 controls? Who, who drives this massive increase? Often the head of risk is from, from my experience, it's been the head of risk. Um, has he come so, from the large accountancy firms? Say again? Has he come from one of the large accountancy firms, for example? Um, <laughs> and, and, does, and does he have his old mates coming in by the hundred to, to do this? Um, yeah. I'm not talking about bank in particular. I'm talking about head of risk generally. I mean, I, 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 I've met obviously lots of heads of risk, and a lot of them come from a consulting background. Um, yep. And they have this approach that everything must be bigger and more complicated. Whereas, yes. like you might think, can't we just get rid of of those twenty three thousand? Can we not get rid of twenty two thousand five hundred of those, so we can make Correct. it manageable? Yes. Um, Hundred percent agree with you, Nigel. That, that's that's course, essentially what we had to do. We had to go in and scrape off the majority of the work. And do you want to know when that happens? They get very upset because they're like, but you just took away all my work. I said, well, 95% of your work is, is crap. It adds no value. And it's just place fillers on an Excel spreadsheet. That's not working for you. Get rid of it. Uh, they get very upset. And so it's also a challenge like because it feels like it's a dent to their ego. It's a dent to the effort and work that they put in. But it's when you're not at when the work that you're putting in just adds volume but not value. It's worthless. Yeah. Just to, to wrap up, really, hmm. one of the things that spins out from what you've been saying about the, the risk department not talking to the compliance department, um, we see exactly the same in relation to fraud departments because fraud has been focused as a risk rather than as a protection for the customers. So now when we're seeing that um, governments are saying, if, you, if, if, if a customer loses money to an online fraud, you've got to give them the money back. Mm. That seems to me to have moved fraud from there to financial crime risk, um, not corporate risk. Mm. Um, and so, I don't think that people are going to be very happy to see that move made because I think it is going to upset their little silos. Um, it's going to start to erode their empires. 
um, within not your bank, but within the banking sector generally, how committed are people to their silos because it's their personal future rather than the bank's future? Completely. They're completely committed to silos. I, we see it all the time. Um, we've even, I, I really wish I could I could say uh, which particular, it's, it's, a, it's a big bank, but I can't say which one because there's only one of them. Um, but essentially it's extremely siloed where policies and processes don't even cross. And the problem is, is that they need to because a particular service or the integration that is being pushed over the borders nationally, it's a movement that needs to happen. It's, it's software that needs to be developed. It's processes and policies that need to be put in place because a correspondent bank will not bank with this particular bank if that is not put in place. Problem is, the whole process is being delayed because it, everything is siloed. And it's, they, it's to the point even where policies and processes, they don't want to share that, the, the actual document, they don't even want to share with another department within the same bank. To a point where I'm like, what's, what, what does that serve? What is the siloed approach? It, and all that, it, as far as I can understand, as I would say, rumor goes, um, is that it's our it's our document. We have pride in it, and it's we don't want any changes to it. Now the problem is the, the particular department needs to make changes to that policy because it's a new service that's being introduced, and the existing policy has been challenged by the correspondent bank, and it needs to make changes. This division absolutely refuses to do that. So to me, that doesn't make sense, and I think a lot of people are more just about me, myself, and I. Uh, make my department look good. Um, don't let anyone encroach on my property. It almost feels like a Game of Thrones happening within a bank. Um, and, and so it's, it's extremely siloed, it's extremely self-centered, and it does not serve the organization. And I don't know if that is, is again, an issue of, of communication of culture, um, strategic objectives, uh, governance processes from the top down. I, I don't know if it's necessary, if it's a governance problem, or even if it's like you can have all the best governance processes in place, the best culture in place, people will still, the mentality, the psychology of people are, this is my land, nobody's allowed on it unless I say so. You know, which is sort of something that we've, that comes with humanities for, for many, many years. So maybe if that's the psychology, I don't know. But again, I don't know if in this particular bank, it's a governance uh, issue. It, is it a culture issue? What it is, but what I find absolutely, you know, uh, bewildering is the fact that these process just something is like a document that needs to cross over to another department who needs to incorporate their processes for this new product that is happening across the bank. That is not being that's not being shared. Something is as as minute as that, just sharing the document, doing tracked changes on it, and then sending it back for approval, opening the communication channel. Something as simple as that is not happening. And I, I, I'm absolutely, you know, struck by it. I, I, I don't know how this is even being allowed or possible. And nobody's going to report it. Nobody is going to action it. Nobody, it's not being escalated. It just, it, it sits where it is and you now try to navigate it. Except that when one person says, no, not navigating, that's what you're stuck with. So yeah, it's, so it's what, very silent. Why is, in, why is internal audit not picking up on this and reporting this um, bypassing the department heads that are causing the problem um, and internal audit going straight to the board and saying, we have this problem. Bureaucracy, favoritism, um, politics. A failure, to, a, failure to learn the less, a failure to learn the lessons um, of everything from Enron, HIH, every, every major corporate catastrophe. The, yeah. the, the final report into why it happened ultimately says, People within the company knew what was happening, but nobody said anything. And we're not talking about whistleblowing. We're not talking about there being somebody who's doing yeah. something wrong here. We're talking about reports for the benefit of the company that are not yes. being made because they don't want to upset their mates. Yes. Effectively, in many cases. Yes. Really absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much indeed.